like to call the uh, October uh, 17th meeting uh, to order. Uh, Dr. Dory's up there fi fixing the technology for tonight, but we'll uh, get started on, on some of the other issues. So, so tonight we're gonna uh, we as we always start with 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 public input not pertaining to something anything on the agenda, and we'll do. Uh, consent agenda and then uh, reports uh, after that I've uh, rearranged the the uh, the uh, new business a little bit so we'll start with the uh, school uh, uh, capital uh, discussion and from that we'll go to the uh, middle school uh, middle school math and uh, social studies update and and then finally the MCAS presentation tonight we will not do the uh, brochure because the one that went in the packet isn't the one we were going to talk about tonight so we'll put that off until uh, the I think the 28th so, so uh, hearing that so is there any uh, public input for anything that's not on the agenda Someone signed up. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Share a lot. Good evening. Um, I'm here to talk about the Friends of Reading Metco program that we started. Um, you mind just for just for the record saying your name? Oh, so. I'm Cheryl Lestrade. Thanks. I'm a parent at Parker Middle School. Um, and I'm here representing Reading Friends of Mecco, and we are having, we're hosting a family-style dinner, um, potluck, on November 2nd in Boston, and we would like to invite all of our, both communities, both Boston and Reading families and administrative staff to attend so that we can share in our community events, as well as build bonds between the two communities and learn and share from, with each other um, and make a stronger community. We look forward to seeing you all there. Yes? Can I just a quick question? What time? Oh, I'm sorry. Four <laughs> to six. Thank you. And where would that yeah, be? Yeah, I was going to say. It's going to be in Boston at um, Greenwood Shalom Church. Yes. Uh, Cheryl, so I know there was a save the date uh, brochure. Will you just update that and send it to us so we can send that out through multiple venues? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Now we'll uh, have the consent agenda. Is there, you want to read the motion for <coughs> Move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Before, uh, no, is there a second? I'll second, second it. Is there anything that anyone would like to remove? From Mr. Weiss. I'd like to remove the Parker Middle School Quebec trip, the RMHS skating club trip, the RMHS Swiss, Swiss exchange field trip, and the approval of minutes. Or at least discuss them before we approve, I guess, would be the better way to put it. Okay, so do you want to just give an explanation on each one? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, I think back in May we had a conversation around trip policies, um, the trip policy as it is, and what the checklist was of all the things we're supposed to have in that policy. Um, and I want to first, the first one I want to talk about is the Parker Middle School Quebec trip. Um, the documentation for that trip is now impeccable. Um, it's got it's an excellent package. It's got an ex excellent example of curriculum alignment, which we had not really seen in quite some time. An excellent example of how the remaining students will be covered as well. Um, I just wanted to commend that. You know, we don't always talk about excellence when delivered, yeah. and I just wanted to commend that as excellence. Um, so that's that's the one on that front. If anybody else wants to speak to that one before I move on. No. Nope. Okay. Um, the RMHS skating club trip, I think I'm a little bit more 
curious about than anything. Um, as far as I'm reading the policy, and I may be missing something or I might be missing a policy, so I'm curious. This trip is taking place on a Saturday, not on a, not on a weekday. Um, it's not academic. It is out of state, so that might be the reason we have to approve it. Um, and it does say that it's being um, parent-driven instead of bus-driven. Um, so I just wanted to, other than that, there's no problem with it necessarily. Um, there's one minor. It's out of state. It's out of state. That's why you have to That's approve it. That's why we have to approve it. Okay. Um, there's one other, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it, question or issue with it just from a correction perspective, and that's minor, and I think we can agree to make that minor adjustment. It technically asks for the chaperone's ability to compete in the engagement instead of take the, take the students to the competition, if that makes any sense. If you read the last sentence of the request, it says to allow Mrs. Burke to compete in the competition. Um, and I think we could make a friendly amendment that that's not what we're approving. We're approving her taking them to the competition with the parents, if anybody has any objections to that. Can you say where? I'm yep. Going up to it right now, it is, um, and now my computer slowed down. So if you look at uh, the letter from Mrs. Boynton to Dr. Doherty, it says, I respectfully request permission for Mrs. Burke to compete in this skating competition. I would expect she's not actually competing, but maybe Mrs. Boynton can speak to that if that is actually what's uh -huh. happening. Um, So I don't think that was the expectation. I think we're just approving okay. the trip, and, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I'm sorry. So she's not competing? She's not competing. She's, she's yeah. the advisor. Okay. Where did it say that? So mine says Thank they you. will be competing. Respectfully request for oh, Mrs. Yeah. Burke. Letter. They will be competing is the first paragraph, that's and that's correct, and I think that's what we're approving, but I just want to make sure we're not, yeah. it's not for us to approve whether she competes anyway, but that's, <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's that one. And um, moving forward into the RMS H Swiss exchange field trip, and I think this is, uh, I don't know if it's cleared up in the printed packet, but we cleared it up with Dr. Doherty an email earlier today. Um, the actual request from the chaperone says 2021, and all the description, all the background says that was 15, <coughs> 17, 19, and so it's going to be odd years. The uh, language, um, again, coming from the request actually says April 2020. So I wanted to make sure that we're clarifying that the request is 2021. It is 2020. Not 2020. Um, 2021. It's 2021. 2021. Okay. And Which, yeah. I cleared up an email. I clarified I to you in an email today. I wanted to make sure everybody else was on the same page of that agreement. Um, and before I jump forward to anything else, anybody else want to add anything on any of these trips? I think I want to bring it up at the end of all the questions. Um, and then the last one, I guess it's it's minor, and maybe it's just not posted yet. Um, but considering we usually include it, and it includes a, a mention of it, is the approval of the minutes. As here's the YouTube link, but the link is not there yet, so we can provisionally approve, provided the link is added yeah. um, to the minutes as necessary. Would be my recommendation. Can we accept that as a friendly amendment? Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I thought you were that? talking to Tom. Oh, we can uh, accept that as a friendly amendment, right? Yes. If, that's, if you're making that's, if you're right. that's my it. That's okay. my amendment. <laughs> Provisionally approve as long as we can put the YouTube link on it. I will second that. Does that? Uh, that's, that covers mine, yes. Dr. Doc. Yeah. Um, I had a question, and I'm wondering if I just missed it, um, on the skating trip. I'm wondering, because they're the parents are driving is there a waiver that will be available for the parents and the children so that everyone is covered you to asking have me? sorry you asking me uh, um yeah sure <laughs> not asking me because i don't know <laughs> <laughs> there is an individual field trip form that every student has to complete which has that information on it that it will be parents driving correct Awesome, because I remember seeing in our policies that we <clears throat> don't usually do parent. There, um, yes. Just to go on that is there is in our policy a reference to policy EEAG, which does say that the parent drivers have to have a certain level of liability insurance and other things along those lines. So presuming they'll be given that material and they'll certify to that as well um, as part of the driving process. 
um, and my other um, my other question actually comes out of my experience in the wonderful um, diversity class, equity class from that Karen Hall um, led and will be leading again and will become part of our mentor program with our new teachers. Um, and so I was looking at these wonderful trips and thinking about A, how wonderful they are and B, how hard it must be for parents or families who are on free and reduced lunch to think about attending, having their children attend these trips. Um, and I have been told that um, there are accommodations that are, are ma often made, and, um, but it's very hard to guarantee that's always going to be the case. And so I just wanted to bring it up that I think these trips are really important for everyone and that maybe as a school committee um, and with the administration, we can put our thinking caps on to figure out ways to support students um, when there isn't support there to help those who can't afford the trips to go. And I hate for it all to fall on principles to have to do that. But I just wanted to make the point that everybody ought to be able to go on these whole school trips. And I'm not talking about the other, excuse me, the other trips necessarily that are the perks, but exchange programs and trips to Quebec or um, New York or DC. Those are trips that if desired, anybody should be able to go with their class. And that's how we build community and build relationships. So. I just wanted to bring that up, and I'm not asking for a vote on it or anything. I just want us to keep that in mind and, and maybe put it on an agenda to, to discuss how we might be able to support kids in the future. So, yes. Um, a lot of the times with these trips, the companies that are, are providing the travel and everything else have scholarship funds. Uh -huh. Um, that. that you can put in for if you cannot financially do it. Um, you have to do your research and know what you have to provide, but it is available already um, on a lot of them. Awesome. Yes. I knew there was more for me to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also add that by policy, we've already said that it should be supported. Policy IJOA has an affordability clause. It specifically says field trips should be affordable and accessible to all qualified and interested students. Students may be allowed but not required to participate in reasonable group fundraising efforts to defray the cost of field trips. No student is denied the opportunity to participate in an academic day field trip because of the inability to pay. Now, you could argue whether or not some of these international ones are academic day, but they're going during some of the academic days, so I think they fit. Uh, when the policy was written, the day trips are just the day-long trips, not, not the overnights or. So I so think that's what the def, that's what was the true spirit of that. I think we should, uh, and you know, probably not tonight, but uh, look into maybe uh, extending this the the overnight trip to the uh, policy the policy that we use for our fees. So that would, you know, have uh, them apply to, to central office for a way, you know, how we have a wa waivers for athletic fees mm -hmm. and stuff, go, go through we that. We would not legally be able to do that. Okay, why not? It, because these are extracurricular field trips. So I would n not easily be able to use taxpayer funded dollars out of the operating budget to pay for these trips? Fees are meant to be used for the activity that you're paying for. So for athletics, you would have to use it for the athletic program, for example. Right. And the athletic one is for athletics and clubs, though, is it not? No. Just, no. Athletics. Just athletics. We do not have a club <clears throat> fee. Yeah, we do. Oh, well, I guess That goes drama. into the student activity. No, well, that's, that's, an act, that's an, a fee for drama. All right, well... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure it, we'll figure something out. Uh, you know, at least, you know, we'll vet it and figure out whether there's something we can do. Thank you. Anything else? So uh, that now we will uh, 
vote on the uh, consent agenda that that doesn't have the items removed. So is there any other, all those in favor? Five zero. Now we'll uh, have four separate motions. Uh, one for the, yeah, the Parker um, trip. Move to approve the Parker Middle School Quebec field trip as detailed in our packet. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Move to approve the RMHS skating club trip as detailed in tonight's packet. As second. amended. I'll second that. As, as, amended. as amended. As amended. Yep. Thank you. It was seconded. All those in favor? Five zero. Move to approve the RMHS Swiss Exchange field trip as detailed in tonight's packet. Was it amended? Was it? It was. The date was amended. The date it was, was amended. As amended. They're all. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Five zero and the minutes. Yep. Uh, approve. Uh, move to approve the minutes dated September 26, 2019. As amended. As amended. Second. All those in favor? Five <laughs> <laughs> someone else in charge. But they <laughs> still have the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> they were changed. <laughs> now we'll uh, have reports. Uh, Maura. So does that mean it's approved? So, oh, I don't know. All right, I don't know if it's showing. Okay. So this fall, RMHS students have been busy participating in a variety of activities. In terms of sports, boys soccer and volleyball are up for tournament. In terms of football, varsity, varsity football is doing extremely well. They're four and one, and tomorrow they have a very important game against Winchester, which could determine who's the Middlesex League champions. Also, Girl Swim is undefeated. <laughs> um, in terms of the musical, the fall musical is Chicago. Rehearsals are in swing for the musical, and the musical is going to be in early November. Also a fun um, event coming up is the Environmental Club. On October 30th, members of the Environmental Club are gonna take a field trip to UMass Amherst, and they're gonna participate in an Envirothon workshop. So what they're going to do is they're gonna take classes from some of the most recognized environmental professionals in Massachusetts, where they're gonna gain a lot of insight on environmental issues. And then lastly, the first High Five Award has already been issued out. So the High Five Award is a tradition where a senior is um, acknowledged for their academic and extracurricular achievements. So the first senior was Juliana Ferreros, and she cited in her, her High Five that her experience in NHS and her weekly volunteering in the Reading Food Pantry has been some of the most meaningful parts of her high school experience. She hopes to pursue health science in college and eventually become a physician. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to start at this end tonight, <laughs> Dr. Styes. Thank you. I'm going to actually do um, one more student-driven activity um, just to give it a, a plug. The Crossroads program at the high school is actually doing Socktober, where they are collecting socks and going to donate them to Cradles to Crayons. So if anyone would like to donate new socks, they could go to the high school, which is exciting that the program's taking that on. One of the other exciting things that um, is happening is um, the physical therapist actually got a grant to create sensory paths at each of the elementary schools, and they've started to work on them um, in the outside play areas. And the physical therapists are painting things on the ground, and that work has started, and it's uh, very nice to see. Um, some of the other things that we've been doing as a department is really working on streamline our, streamlining our processes so that we can really remain student focused. So for example, we're working on our um, 504s and the way that we are structuring all of the processes. So we worked with Michael Joyce and created a binder, a resource staff binder that talks about all the laws, policies, and procedures, and then also has all the forms in Word document that can be um, easily, easily accessible to staff and uploaded into our um, data system. Um, so that we can ensure we have accurate data. And so we've done several trainings. We've worked with the nurses, 
the guidance staff, the building administrators, the team chairs, and we're setting up meetings with the school psychologists and a few other stakeholders to make sure we're really leveling the playing field and on the same page around how we are processing things across the district. Um, with that, we are also working on aligning the practices and communications so that when we're sending notifications home, they're going out in the same timeline in the same format to families so that there's not a mixed message or things are lost in backpacks or um, stuck in an email box. Some of the other things that are big from the state, we're, we're starting our tiered focus monitoring um, and I am in frequent contact with one of our state um, people who's been going through all of our data and we are updating our policies and procedures as we go along. So we have already updated um, the, our file system. We have uh, made some changes to our meeting reschedule form so it's very clear in the file why a meeting is rescheduled. Um, and we're really talking about aligning IEP dates so that we don't have gaps or unnecessary meetings. And we've been talking to um, the CPAC about that and making sure that all of the staff and parents and administration understands the processes. Um, and the other thing, um, Allison Wright and myself, Allison is the assistant administrator who has tremendous knowledge and understanding of the systems in Reading. She and I put together a, um, a presentation about the difference between IEPs and 504s. We've been out to some of the schools and done presentations at staff meetings and then followed up with some drop-in sessions so that we are at the schools if anyone has a question that they didn't want to ask individually and um, some of the things that are happening at the um, CPAC which has been so exciting is we had a school psychologist come to the last meeting <coughs> she's offered to do some parent training and we're going to work with the CPAC around what that will look like and um, one of our um, BCBAs and team chairs has off, also offered to work with the CPAC, the police department, and the fire department around student safety and how we make sure that we are um, working together as a community. Um, and some of the last things um, that we talked about in terms of my entry plan, but also as long-term goals, besides creating data systems to look at reading, homeless, tutoring, really creating a five-year plan for all of the substantially separate programs and the learning center. Um, part of that is looking at the program descriptions, but knowing who are the students, what are we doing, what's our mission and vision, and what's the data collection system. So um, that's a lot of what we talked about at the CPAC meeting this month. Thank you. I was just going to give a quick update um, on extended day to let folks know that um, tremendous progress has been made um, on the wait list. We did have our second round of proposals that were, came in last Wednesday the 9th at 1 o'clock. So Sandy Calandrella and I are in the process of going through looking at the references. We will be awarding um, contracts early next week to um, those that have provided information and have met all of our requirements. So we're looking forward to continuing to bring the vendors in. We are now down to approximately 64 people still remaining on the wait list. And again, this is down from 232 based upon our last update. So we are continuing to make steady progress um, as we continue to bring the vendors in as well as looking at our hiring. And so far, things have been going smoothly. We will be, um, I have asked Sandy and her staff to check in regularly at the buildings to make sure the vendors are acting as we would expect them to and doing continuous progress reports on them. So, so far it has been going smoothly. So we did wanna provide an update on that and we will continue to assess it as we bring more vendors in and continue to look at our staffing. Great, thanks. Chris, did you do you have a question? Oh, you, out of those 64, do we know that all are still waiting for extended day? 
Um, so it's Some a combination morning. summer morning, summer afternoons, but to the best of our knowledge, they are still, we find out some people are no longer waiting when we call them to let them know they're off the list. So to the best of our knowledge, all of them are still waiting, but we will be reaching out to each of them as space frees up. And if they're no longer on the list, we'll move on to the next one. Which leads to the yeah. next question. Getting from, I think it was 151 last update down to 64. Is that because we filled, you know, 87 spots or is it because we filled 40 and 47 opted out? I don't have those exact, but my understanding is a majority of it because we filled them. We have not had a lot of people opt out. If anything, they may have opt out on the number of days, but not opt out completely. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Ms. Kelly. Uh, sure. Um, so I, I know uh, my team's going to be presenting a lot tonight, so just a quick update. Um, this, the fall is, as you know, a very busy time for learning and teaching. Um, we are once again working on the Reading Institute Fall. As Linda mentioned, we are running our cultural proficiency class that started yesterday. Um, and we have 23 uh, participants. Um, and we'll be running that again throughout the year. Uh, that right now it's mostly uh, veteran teachers that are taking it, but it will be part of our uh, teacher induction program, so it will be a required course as we move forward. Um, next week is STEM week. Uh, in the learning and teaching update, which will go out um, with Dr. Jardy's Pathways this weekend for the community, uh, there's more details around that. Congratulations to Heather Leonard, who's here tonight, who applied for a grant and received some funding to buy some things, and she has lots of fun things planned around town. Uh, so we invite people to check out the um, update in the Pathways this weekend and plan around it. Um, we're doing a lot of training in-house, as we've talked about with PD. We really do a combination of after school, summer, and during the day. Um, kind of too many to mention, but uh, doing a, some reading work, doing some math work, definitely working with elementary teams this year. Uh, we decide to break up elementary teams on Wednesday afternoons so that we don't have so many people all at once. So this week was K-1, next week will be 2-3, and the following week will be 4-5. Again, kudos to my department for working on that. Um, Kate and I will be working with the high school department heads next week on some curriculum training. We're bringing a consultant in to do some work on sort of um, systems thinking as far as curriculum, you know, the curriculum guides and now what? What's our next steps? Um, and towards that vein, we are, we rebranded our middle school PLCs and uh, we now have curriculum leads and we're doing some front loading training on how to work through the curriculum process, especially around working on curriculum guides and really sort of organizing your units. Again, I say this all the time, but so many great things happening in Reading schools, but sometimes in isolation and sometimes not memorialized. And really, how do we pull all those rich resources, tools, and programming and sort of bank it together so that we're, we're rowing in the same direction? So lots of exciting things. It's been a very busy uh, month uh, for our department. So just uh, behavioral coach, data coach, medco team, learning and teaching team principals. Uh, we've been, every day, we've had multiple things. Our calendars have been jam-packed. So it's really exciting, and it's sort of setting the stage for the year. So thank you to everyone. Great, thank you. Dr. Darty. I uh, just wanted to point out in the packet a couple of pieces of information uh, that are in the middle of your packet. There are two pages on enrollment. This October 1st is when we report out officially to the state uh, for the, for the uh, enrollment purposes, and, um, and that's part of how the, that's the demographic piece uh, that's used on the DESE website and uh, other sources. You can see we've broken it down by elementary, and also uh, you see the, the pre-K to 12 picture as well. So I wanted to point that out to you. Also, um, we've now had the, um, the Jewish holidays, and so uh, we try, you know, at this time to show you the attendance. Um, so you can see there the, um, this is the reported student and staff uh, um, attendance for uh, those that uh, took the religious holidays. That me doesn't necessarily mean that others did not, but when they call in for an absence, which it is an exempt absence, um, and they say religious holiday, that's how we record it. Uh, with staff, there's a, there's a whole nother process that they go through um, in terms of uh, the approval process. So this is the ones, uh, the, 
the students and staff that we know of um, that have, you know, requested the day and it took the day. Yes. So just, just to clarify, when I looked at it in the past, you've done all the absences. These in this chart were only those that said they were out for the Jewish holidays. Correct. So there were more absences than just on this chart on those Correct. days. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so are you going to talk more about the accommodation, or is this the time to ask questions about that? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so my other question was, um, I had heard from folks that there were still some glitches in the implementation of the policy, and was wondering what's, what happens when that happens? What's the process? when there are labs or, or tests or projects that are due on the holiday or the next day. It, what, what do you, I'm confused about what do you mean what happens? Like, so what's the follow-up? Um, have people, I know they've been reported to us. Um, so if they've been reported to you, I would encourage the, uh, the person that reported to you to make sure that they have made the building principal aware of it so that the building principal can have a conversation uh, with the teacher that may have been involved. If they've not reported it to the school, we may not be aware of it. So I guess my question is, did you have other reports, aside from the one that was sent to all of us, I believe there was one that was sent to all of us, right? I did not receive, I I did not receive I anything. I thought it went to all of us. No. Huh, okay. So did you have other reports? I did not receive any reports. Building principals may have received reports, um, okay. which would have been the appropriate thing to happen. I did not receive any reports. Okay. Thank you. That doesn't mean there weren't uh, situations that happened. But I'm not saying that. Um, okay. But so building principals would follow up with, with those with the, teachers the teacher involved. To clarify yes. the po yes. policy. And we also had discussed about teachers being uncomfortable or not sure of how to adhere to the policy. Are teachers feeling, what are you hearing back from teachers about the policy as it is now? Are you hearing anything back from teachers? In terms of- uh, Implementing the policy. In terms of implementing the policy? I think that sometimes, I mean, we obviously communicated it out um, I know the principals did it in their weekly newsletters to staff. I did it in the district newsletter to both staff and to the community. Um, we made it very clear the days that there should be homework assigned or not have homework assigned. I mean, it was, it was pretty much spelled out. I think sometimes the challenge is, you know, what, what teachers are struggling with is how do you teach on those days without it being a one-time event or something like that. So, that's always going to be, you know, something that, that teachers are, you know, going to be wrestling with, and, and that's where we work with them to come up with appropriate ways to, to do that. Okay. I just didn't know if people were getting more comfortable with this and figuring that out more, or whether it's still, uh, uh, how big an issue it I is. I think there's always right. going to be those challenges that, that happen, just, just because it's, you know, the nature of the situation, students are out, and they're out for religious holidays, and, you know, how do you design the learning experiences on that day without making sure that students who are out are not um, impacted significantly? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Can I just add to this a little bit, just so, so you're not alone, but um, I, I also had heard feedback, but was hoping it would go back to the appropriate paths as well. Um, it very well may have. And it may have. It and may have, Tom. Many of them are here, so they can maybe yeah. speak to it later. But um, one of the things that I had heard or had seen and had personal experience about, and the policy does not exclude it, so there's nothing wrong with it, but for the rest on the board, it might be something for us to consider in the future, is the day after, there were three, four, or five tests for some kids, especially in high school. That is in the policy. That is in the policy. Um, yeah, that's, in the policy. that's in the policy. Yeah. Yeah. Tests not. can happen the day after. No. 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 Nope. Okay, Later then, in the week. then there was absolutely 
Violent, and accidental. My my advice, if that is happening, is for the parents to make that aware to the to the building principal or even to the teacher directly, so that it can be addressed. Okay. Um, I, I had read it as that just homework wasn't due the next day, even myself. So even I was confused um, about whether taking a test the next day um, is suitable or not. Um, and obviously, a teacher can tell you a week in advance, so you have enough time to study that doesn't impact the holidays theoretically. Um, but it did lead to quite a thing of build up in many cases where the day after, especially the two day one, boom, you get hit with three or four tests that next day. And Maura was nodding over there, so I know I'm not crazy. Um, it especially happened at the high school mm -hmm. um, where there are more tests probably than others. Um, so, yeah, I just, I think maybe for us, it might be something for us to reconsider and ask feedback from the principals from an execution perspective if there are other things we need to think about in the policy or ways to make it easier to follow or ways to make it clearer or something else because it is, con I see nodding out there too, so it is still a challenge um, from what I hear and what I see with my own students as the case may be. Not through people not trying, it's just a challenge. Dr. Doherty, did you have any? I did not have anything else. I'll be talking in a minute. Mr. Wise. Um, sure. Um, so this technically isn't liaison, so Chuck may slap my, my wrist, but uh, we, Dr. Doherty and I, were able to attend the Jason Lewis's uh, Student Opportunity Act um, presentation at the beginning of October uh, with many other school committee and superintendents from around the Middlesex, more or less the Middlesex League, but Jason's um, specific area. Um, so I think in our best, the best thing for us coming out of that is transportation uh, for our out of district special education, um, but there might be a few other peaks, uh, you know, perks here or there as the case Potentially MSBA down the road. Yeah, MSBA is probably the next best one from a school development perspective as they raised the cap there by 150. And there was an amendment to get it to, to 200 million. I don't know if that passed. I, forget, I didn't actually follow through on that. Um, FinCom wise, uh, the meeting last night at the financial forum, um, frankly, was a little lightly attended. I think we were probably all hoping that it would be more highly attended. Um, but at the end, they were going through the warrant and voting on the warrant articles. And one particular item, which we're about to discuss, uh, they tabled um, their vote for that, uh, which was dependent upon our vote and agreement on what we want to do in that space. So just a note for everybody, that there is a dependency on our discussion, whether it's approved today or not approved or next week or whenever it may be. Um, FinCon's holding off their approval as a result of that. Um, and that's the liaison related updates. Thank you. I have two quick reports. Um, <clears throat> as Dr. Stiles mentioned, the CPAC met two nights ago on Tuesday, October 15th. There's really good turnout for the second month in a row. We're seeing real energy around the CPAC and a lot of parents attending every month. Um, and as Dr. Stiles mentioned, <coughs> real interest in partnering with other organizations in the broader community. So just like a lot of um, a lot of brainstorming about the good work that CPAC can do this year. So it was a real pleasure. Um, the big news out of CPAC is that we have a new board. There were elections and the CPAC elected a new board. So I did want to take a moment to thank Sarah McLaughlin, who was the CPAC board. She herself was the entire board last year. Nobody else was <laughs> stepped up. So she independently continued and did all the work to make CPAC run last year and did a phenomenal job. So I, I want to thank Sarah for her volunteerism and her work last year. And I want to congratulate and let the committee know that this year the CPAC board, we had four volunteers agree to serve as the board. They are Laura Noonan, Amy Stewart, Maria Morgan, and Alyssa Scafarati. Scafarati, I think. Um, so just really excited to work with them and Dr. Stiles this year. So it was a great meeting. My other update is um, Understanding Disabilities reached out. As everyone knows, they're an independent nonprofit here in Reading that provide programming in our schools to support our, all of our students in understanding um, different kinds of disabilities their peers might have and making sure our communities, our, our school communities are as inclusive and respectful as possible. So they do great work in our community and they have a really fun fundraiser coming up this Saturday, October 19th, from seven to 12 at the Matera Cabin. Um, they are having pet portraits by a professional photographer. <laughs> for $60, um, you can bring your four-legged family members um, to the Matera cabin, and you will get 15 minutes with a professional photographer and one digital fi file. Print packages are available. Proceeds benefit understanding disability. And if I missed any details or you forgot, 
everything can be found at understandingdisabilities.org. One thing I'll add to that yes. is there are registration time slots. So it's not just all the oxen free come in and you get your picture taken, <laughs> but there are time slot registrations starting around 7 o'clock in the morning so going to about 11 in the morning. sign up for your yeah. slot. You sign up for your slot. So. It's probably a good idea. You don't need that many pets running around. <laughs> Might make it a little chaotic. Thank you. Dr. Doc. Um, just a couple quick ones. Um, the ad hoc meeting for the Human Rights Organization is going to be next Tuesday night. Yep. So it's open to the public and it's a great way to know what's happening and get your ideas into the mix in terms of what the mission and the structure should be about the ultimate Human Rights Organization in Reading. Um, also, next report, um, I am on the RCTV board now and they are, and I have not yet had a meeting while I've been a liaison yet, but next um, Thursday, October 24th, is their annual meeting in pumpkin carving. So at six o'clock, please come to RCTV and have fun and learn more about an amazing resource that helps us get this information out to all of you. So, um, and then the last piece just to mention was while um, Mr. Wise and Dr. Darty were at the um, Student Opportunity Roundtable, um, Ms. Okay, Kelly yeah. and, and I were at the, there was someone else there too. Anyways, at the State of Hate with Robert Treston that was put on by Reading Embraces Diversity and I found it a really important meeting to be at just, um, to have emphasized that Reading's not alone in the things that we've been grappling with in terms of the swastika as a hate. It's on the rise. It's documented the numbers are scary, but Reading has been addressing the issue and is a trendsetter. I've heard um, Ms. Kelly talk about how it's not about that it's happening, it's here. It's about what we do with it, that we become role models. So we are dealing with it here and other people will see how to deal with it in their communities looking at how we've approached things and so i was really proud sitting there um, thinking about how our schools have addressed that and how contagious that is the the love the addressing of the issues is um, and empowering our town also to deal with it one of the other things that um, they mentioned which i was really excited about was that there's legislation now, the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, and the Armenian community, which in and of itself is a really remarkable partnership, shows a lot of progress, it's wonderful, are talking, are, um, have put together a legislative proposal to have genocide education in the schools, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but over the past, it's been an option to teach about the Holocaust or genocides. It's not required in the curriculum and the frameworks. And so there is a proposal to make it law, like in the civ civics um, curriculum. And I, yeah, I hope Yeah, it doesn't you will. actually say where it would go. Um, it's, it's right now, this fall, it's one of um, the things that they're gonna be talking about at the state level. Um, and it, they, they also, if passed, they will recommend curriculum materials that may help support that work. They're looking at certain time spans of the Armenian Genocide and of course the Holocaust. Um, and they're not sure if it would be for like middle school or high school. You know, I know Facing History does some of that work. So that there'll definitely be more to come with that if, if, it, if, it, if it gets passed this fall. Is there any I'm, money with it? Or uh, probably an unfunded mandate. Um, that seems <laughs> to be the way worry. things go. But I go. think that's why it could be difficult and, because there's been a lot of pushback. The, the on, line says the, the department may provide training, yeah. seminars, conferences. Typically what they've been doing is they have a grant process and you can apply for a grant or to either pilot or try things for free and then they'll give some recommendations. That would be something we would definitely be interested in. It'll see, we'll see, have to see how this evolves. I was very excited to yep. hear that because unfortunately our resource of the survivors that have been giving of themselves and their time yeah. coming to our schools, they're, they're getting, getting older. Older. Yeah. very old mm -hmm. and it's harder and harder and so there needs to be another yep. way to make sure that our future generations know what happened and to fight against the denial 
of that. So those are my reports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Joe. You still awake back there? <laughs> <laughs> The third night in a row. I know. I've been out every night this week. Every night. That was the thing that broke camp. Joe, <laughs> Joe and Gail are going to be uh, adding to this presentation as well. Um, <clears throat> so, what we're going to be talking about, um, and we briefly discussed it last night at the Finance Committee meeting. Um, but we did tell the Finance Committee that we wanted, we would be going in much greater detail this evening. What, what we want to do is we want to focus on one particular part of uh, the elementary space update that we had become aware of um, last spring when we started seeing, and I, I think if you remember at one of the school committee meetings, you did have some public input about a concern uh, at a certain grade level at Birch Meadow um, for, for this year. And so through the elementary space study, we asked um, GNAP Associates, who, who is doing the study, um, and they subcontracted out NESDEC for the enrollment piece to take a look at um, the Birch Meadow piece and if there were possible solutions on how we could address the space issue that uh, we were going to be facing in the 2021 school year. So this is for next year that we're talking about. So that's primarily what, what the focus of this presentation is. At a, at a later date, we will be presenting to you um, the enrollment study and in, in space study um, in much more detail. So this, uh, as I said to you earlier, the study began in 2019. Uh, GNAP Associates is, is currently uh, doing the study and they subcontracted out NESDEC to do the, the enrollment piece. Um, they'll, and so what GNAP did for us is they took a look at what were the possible options that we could look at uh, both internally and externally for Birch Meadow for um, the 2021 school year. What we're seeing, and I'm going to go in a little bit more detail, is that we definitely need two and possibly three additional classrooms for Birch Meadow students above and beyond what currently exists for next year. So this is driven by two factors. The first factor is increased enrollment, particularly at the K-2 level uh, since the 2017-18 school year at Birch Meadow. So in 2017-18, uh, we saw uh, the Birch Meadow had an enrollment of 370 students. Uh, the 2019-20 school year, which is the current year, they are now up to 384. So what we're seeing is that the um, what is happening is, is that this doesn't even include, for next year, eight additional students that we are aware of, both the half-day students that were moved to Killam for one year and they're coming back, and we are also aware of at least three private-day kindergarten students that are coming back to Birch Meadow for grade one. So this doesn't even include those eight additional students. So we will definitely have a first grade next year, in the range of a 24, 25 class size. Um, so that will be three classrooms that are dedicated right now for grade one. So we will need an additional classroom so that there will be four classrooms needed at grade one next year at Birch Meadow. You can also see, and I'm going to show you a slide in a minute, that the Birch Meadow enrollment is going to continue to grow. And in the 2023-24 school year, they will be up to 410 students. And that's the NESDEC projection. And that's based on um, births in the Birch Meadow District right now throughout the last few years. It's based on housing turnover. Um, it's based on developments in the Birch Meadow District. Um, that really, that's what NESDEC is looking at um, as, as, we, as they're going through that process. We are also seeing, so that's one, one of the drivers. The second driver is an increase and the number of students in the Compass program at Birch Meadow. Um, this program is designed to support students uh, with disabilities of students who are on the autism spectrum. And we have two, uh, the Compass program is more of a sub-separate program. We do have the Connections program as well, but that is more of an integrated 
uh, program in, in the inclusionary program in the classroom. So in 2015 and 16, there was one classroom dedicated to the Compass program. In 16-17, that was increased to two because of the number of students um, that we were servicing. Um, this year, uh, and we hired the teacher for this year uh, in the FY20 budget, uh, we have two classrooms plus a smaller classroom um, that, that they are using for, for the, the, pro, the students in this program. Next year, we know that we are going to need a third full-size classroom. So these are, these are taking the general classroom spaces so that we can adequately address the needs of the students um, in, in this program. So next year, we are definitely going to need an additional full-size classroom space. So that's where the two came from. The third classroom um, right now was a result of, of the original reason why we started looking at this, which was grade two, the enrollment was, was at a point where we were going to need to address it um, for the 2021 school year. And actually, we, were, we couldn't address it this year, although it should have been addressed this year. What happened was is that some of those students actually moved to different parts of Reading. So some of those students left Birch Meadow, they went to another part of Reading um, and, and moved to other to schools. So they bought homes and uh, relocated. So that brought the, the, that enrollment down to, the, to 22 and 23 um, for this year. So this is the NESDEC slide that I was referring to. You can see that, um, and this was done in April of 2019. Uh, this is going to get updated before we present to you with the October 1st enrollment so that we have the most accurate projections. Um, but you can see that it, this, this projection is even off by two students for this year because right now we're at 384. This projection said 382. So we're already seeing that it's, it's off a little bit and it's in the, in the additional students. But you can see that in the 20... Um, 324, I think school year, yeah, 23, 24 school year, uh, that it'll be up to 410 students um, at Birch Meadow according to the NESDEC projection. This is the slide that, uh, the, the, that you have in your packet. The only thing that I changed is I changed teachers to classrooms so that you could see that um, because some of our kindergartens, the half are considered a 0.6. So I converted that to a classroom because that, that is a full-size classroom space that's being used. But essentially, this is the, uh, the form that you saw in your uh, packet that shows the current enrollment. What I wanted to do, too, is give a little bit of a historical perspective of how space needs have changed um, in the Reading Public Schools since uh, 2005. So 2005, the reason why I use that date is that pre-Wood End pre-Birch uh, Barrows being renovated. And um, just so you could see the, the difference. So the full day kindergarten at the time, we had five, we had one in each uh, building. Um, in 2013, that we were using 10 classrooms dedicated for full day kindergarten. We are now up to uh, 14. And we're anticipating that we'll need 14 next year. We're running about 30 or 40 students a year now that are in half-day kindergarten. That seems to be the trend over the last couple of years. Um, we are in now about 90% of the students uh, are in uh, full-day kindergarten. Um, so in terms of the special education programs, in 2005 we had one program in the district which required one classroom space. In 2013 we were up to uh, six programs. And then you could see in the 2019-20 school year, we have, I broke it down in a little bit more detail because the, the nature of the way we address student needs based on, on their IEPs has changed. We have nine full-size classrooms in the district dedicated to programs at the elementary level. We have six other classrooms, and these are all at Birch Meadow, that are inclusionary classrooms. That's the Connections program that I was referring to earlier. And then we have three smaller classrooms in the district that are used for a variety of reasons, but do are providing services um, to address the child's IEP. Next year, the one difference, and again, we're early in the fall, 
So, and we've learned that special education, the needs change uh, in a matter of weeks, sometimes days. Um, but right now, we are anticipating that the space that we need um, is an additional classroom at Birch Meadow for 10, the six inclusion classrooms, and then three small classrooms. Um, and then the Rice Preschool has also increased, and that's because of the, the, the number of students now that are on um, IEPs that we are required to start providing education at, at age three. Um, and then that means also that we need to have um, what, what they refer to as typical students, and we need a, 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 at a minimum of 51-49% um, in each classroom, typical versus students on, on IEPs. So because that population of students and IEPs have increased over time, we have had to add more students into the program. So you see we have five classrooms in 2005, the program grew to seven in 2013, and now we are at eight. And two of those eight are sub-separate classrooms, I believe. Right. Yes. yes. So that's how the space needs have changed, um, both for full-day kindergarten and special education. I want to continue to emphasize that, and you'll hear this when we do the full presentation of the whole study, a lot of this is being driven by programmatic changes in education over the last uh, several years. Um, the increased need for full-day kindergarten and the increased space required for our uh, programs uh, to keep children in district. Was, uh, sorry, uh, in 2013, those seven, were those were there any subset for classrooms? I believe there was one in 2013. We went to two a couple of years ago. We actually had three at one time uh, two years ago. So that varies and then we went back down to two in the sub-separate. That varies year to year. Yes. Based on APs. Thank you. So now getting into what we looked at in, in a significant amount of time has been put in this summer taking a look at different options. Um, Gail and Joe and Gnap um, reviewing what what potential options we had. We looked. We left no stone unturned. Um, was really the best way to put it. Uh, looking at both space internal uh, in the schools, which would have required construction, um, sometimes very invasive construction. Um, and at other times, taking a look at external solutions. So uh, one of the external solutions, and I'm going to go in a little bit more detail on the internal solutions, but we looked at options at both Birch Meadow and at Wood End um, for those internal construction options. Um, we also looked at uh, repurposing some classrooms at Reading Memorial High School. Uh, in the field house, in the second floor, there are three classrooms. We looked at seeing if we could repurpose those classrooms to like a Birch Meadow annex of classrooms. Uh, most likely that would have been kindergarten. What we found when we looked at that is that the classrooms from a square footage point of view were too small. Um, they were about 720 square feet on average. Uh, you really need at the elementary level 900 uh, to 1,000 for, for elementary classrooms for square feet. Um, we are also looking at installing modular classrooms. Uh, we've been very successful in the six modular classrooms that are at Killam, Joshua, Eaton, and Barrows. Um, teachers love them. Uh, I'm sure air conditioning has one reason why, but <laughs> they, there is adequate space. They're about 1,000 square feet, um, and they really have been a nice addition, and it obviously have address, addressed the space needs. And we've had them now, I think, for five, four or five years, right, Joe? Um, so, and then taking a look at a combination of different options. So what we want to just talk to you a little bit about tonight is some of the options. And so, when, and I'll, we'll focus on Birch Meadow first. And so what, I don't know if this laser works. Yep. Yes, it does, okay. So what, one of the options that we looked at, and at the time we were, we were looking at trying to gain three classrooms at Birch Meadow. That was, that was the goal. Birch Meadow is already over capacity. Um, all of the classrooms are used. All of the, the different spaces are already used uh, for a variety of reasons. And if 
Principal Hendricks was here this evening, she would, she would tell you that as well. <laughs> so what we looked at is how could we gain 850, 900 square feet of classroom space times three. So one of the options we looked at is um, this here is the stage, building a wall here um, and creating a classroom. This would have been one of the specialist classrooms, art, music. Um, this would, there would have been storage here for that classroom. This one here is a little over 800 square feet, I think, to do that. So that was one way that we looked at to gain a classroom. Um, another way that we, a uh, possible way, was to take these yellow spaces, uh, which are a combination of classrooms, meeting spaces, teacher, faculty room, um, storage closets in some cases, and knocking down walls, doing some very invasive construction, and creating classrooms, although may not have been square, they would have been close to adequate um, square footage to be able to um, to gain the classroom space. Um, so that was some of the things with that. We also looked at, and I think it's on the next slide. Yes, it is. Okay. We, we took a look at taking a, the, a piece of the library. So this is, this is right now the entire footprint of the library. Taking, building a wall here. Taking this and capturing it for uh, special education space. There's a wall here right now. Knocking it down and creating uh, additional special education space there. Um, and then another option, which was a very invasive option, and is to take these three, there's currently three classrooms here, to make these into four in, in order to do that. And Joe is much more eloquent in explaining this than me. But essentially, you would have to tear down the existing walls, which are concrete. You would have to, which has also plumbing, heating, fire alarm, fire sprinkles, all that. Um, and you would have to um, build new walls and create four smaller classrooms. And I believe those would have been about 800 or so square feet from doing that. So, and then there's combinations of, of different options. So, the other thing we did was taking a look at Wood End. And with Wood End, we're, we're still exploring a couple of spaces at Wood End to gain a classroom space at Wood End. So we are still, uh, GNAP is taking a look at some potential options there, whether it's taking some larger classrooms and turning two into three, um, or taking uh, some space perhaps at the, um, at the library at, at Wood End and creating another classroom there. So those options are still being, being looked at, and we are getting price estimates for all of, all of the options that we're talking about. We should have those in the, in the next couple of weeks. Joe, I don't know if there's anything you want to say at this point. Yeah, I'm not, so this is, we're talking first about the, so is there any questions on the internal, or Joe if you, or Gail, if you want to say anything on the internal constructions? I think, I think if you could explain uh, the, the wood end project down there. You didn't, you mentioned wood end, but there's a. Uh, I did, I said we're looking at two areas. I understand, but the one area that's, that's shaded up there is is the library. It's the library. The library. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we didn't. You didn't say that. That's what. I'm... So, one of the options that we're looking at is taking a, a piece of the library, about 900 square feet. Um, another option is to take a look at two classrooms and converting it into three, but those are still being explored from those two options. On the Birch Meadow, one of the options you looked at at Birch Meadow was reconfiguring odd spaces that might have been adequate from a square footage perspective, but oddly shaped. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if you mentioned this, but it looked like some of them were internal to the building. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what about windows? No window. They wouldn't be windows. So that option included the possibility of classroom spaces that were adequately sized, but no Correct. natural light. We do have classrooms in the district that do not have natural light. Okay. Um, my other question is, it sounded like in Wood End, if you took three classrooms, I'm sorry, at Birchmeadow, if you took three classrooms and made them four, enormously complicated construction, it sounds like very invasive. <coughs> but it sounded like the square footage of those classrooms would also be a little bit low. Yet at Wood End, it sounds like that's a possibility. Is it because the Wood End classrooms are a little bit bigger? Yes. So there's more square footage to turn three into four. No, no, this would be two, two into, into three. Two into three. Yeah. Same, but the idea is that, that 
that's why it's a more reasonable solution at Wood End than it is at Birch, because the classrooms are bigger to start with? Correct. Yes, so. okay. yes. Thank you. Mr. Wise. Yeah. Um, there are two options there that talk about taking library space. Can you comment on what the library space size is now relative to the rest of the elementary schools and what it would be if either one of those happened? It would become the smallest library the of, the, of the four. Which one? Of the five. Birch Meadow. The Birch Meadow. Um, the current library space is 1,927 square feet. At Birch. At Birch. And what about Wood End if we did that classroom at Wood End? Well, how big is that library? I've heard it's the biggest. The current is 3,200 square feet. So we bring it down to about 2,100, give or take? Uh, yeah, give or take, yeah. Or 23 is the case if my math is correct. Yeah, it depends. Yeah, it de depends where the beams line up and all of that. So then, on average, are we talking about 2,000 square feet for a library in, in our elementary schools? Yeah, approximately. So that would, would end, would bring that down to approximately the average size of the rest of the libraries? Correct. Whereas if we did it at Birch, we'd go basically to half the You'd size. You'd be smaller, of the rest yeah. Of the yeah. And the that other item at Birch to go the equity route is all of the options involved taking over the stage. So it would be the only elementary school without a stage. So that was the other part when we were looking through it that from an equity standpoint. Hmm. Dr. Doxter. Um, I started to raise my hand and then it went out of my brain. That's okay. What I was going to say. I, I will say. Um, I hate the idea of losing the stage, especially right now when Birch Meadow has been working so hard on programs that engage the kids and the families in drama. Um, oh, I know what my other question was. It's about when you're talking about the complicated construction, um, are we talking, and, and you talked, Joe talked about having pipes and other things in the walls that have to be considered when you're moving them. Are we also considering, if we did that construction, that we'd have to be creating bathrooms for rooms and doing that kind of complicated plumbing and stuff as well? Which, which, off, which building? Birch so at the Birch Meadow, you're making two into three. No, three into four. 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 <laughs> Complicated. That's so what we're referring to. Top okay. Well. Yeah, no. So are you also talking about needing to add bathrooms and? Yeah, yes, yeah. there would be bathrooms in those rooms, yes. And, and in terms of looking down the future, those spaces, would they be a merit of, of value to the schools or would they, are they sort of a Band-Aid for now? Like they'd still be great spaces for kids to learn after we have our long-term solution. So that's a, that's a great question. What, we know that a solution is three to five years at least away, at least. So we, you know, obviously we're trying to create solutions that are gonna last us for that long but also, we have to keep in mind that maybe at some point we want to go back, but it, it depends on the invasiveness of the construction. So if you do an option like that, those are staying the way they are. We're not going back to three classrooms. Um, with the stage, yes, you could potentially take this wall down when, if there's a solution down the road, um, which would get that stage back. But the more invasive construction, no, it would stay permanent and be a value and, I mean, and, and be a value like it would be well classroom space is always valued <laughs> it, it, really no I, I mean that's but the way it would it. Yeah. turn out it wouldn't be a compromise the way the the classrooms would be shaped no, you said they wouldn't be going into it if it was wasn't going to be of equal value uh, i didn't know if there was compromise involved well we're, we're presenting to you options, options in Honestly, then none of them are great options except for the one I haven't discussed yet. Um, but none of them are great options when you're making spaces smaller um, or, you know, using a stage or taking a piece of a library. They're the, they're the best of the worst options. So. They're doable. Yeah. I did. So it does seem like, did you, did you say what the square footage of those four would be? If we were to go down this route, I think they're about 820. Okay. When they're when they're 
uh, constructed, I think. As far as these changes go, how much HVAC work, how much plumbing, how yeah. much fire system? I mean, it looks to me that it would be extensive, correct? Correct. Yeah, the, yeah. the options that we're showing you right here would require a sub substantial amount of work done into the building and um, in terms of uh, the uh, heating system in the building would have to be retrofitted in that end of the building. Everything would have to be moved around fire alarm there is no sprinkler system um, fire suppression at that bu at that building in that wing it's in only in the new section of the building but it's very invasive and it would take that building basically offline for about 10 weeks in the summer completely that's the other that's the other issue with it and that building is used for summer programs correct as is wooden in some and, it, way, shape or and it also comes at a very high dollar amount too to do that Can you give us, I know we're not at firm numbers, but ballpark? That, four, making four into three and doing the stage was over a million dollars. Uh, that was the rough order of magnitude we received, just for that. And that's rough. That's rough. Mr. Wise. Joe, you mentioned that that site is not sprinkler yet. If we do this work, would we have to bring it up to certain code as well? Only if you go over 30 percent of the assessed value of the building, then that triggers it. The section of the building that's the um, this end, yeah, that end right there, this that new here. wing is the only sprinkled section of the building. <coughs> so I don't think that um, you know a million dollars on a. I, I'm, I don't really know what the assessed. Schools value. aren't assessed that high. Yeah, for some but reason. still, <laughs> you know, we're not we're not hitting that mark. Yes, this Downing. Hi, I have um, Marianne Downing, Heather Drive. I have a two-part question, one on the earlier enrollment part and one on these ideas, and I appreciate the difficulty you have here. With regards to the increase in the Birch Meadow enrollment, you had mentioned that it was due to new developments in town. Is it... You're understanding that a lot of the th housing being built downtown falls in the Birch Meadow district, or no? What I what I and maybe I I, mean, I apologize if I uh, didn't say it correctly. When Nesdaq is looking at enrollment trends, they look at factors such as live births, they look at housing turnover, and they look at new developments. Right, that's the latter I'm talking about, new developments. Right, but I I didn't say specifically to Birch Meadow. I said that's those are some of the factors they look at when they're determining enrollment projections. Because one of the questions that I wondered when I heard some of that, we, it's been a while since we've had a redistricting, and would redistricting any of the Birch Meadow kids into Wood End solve the problem, or does that not Wood, have to Wood End has no classroom space. Okay. So, so there's every, no every building is full. Oh. We're full. <laughs> that's, that's the challenge we're facing. We don't have a place where we can even, and the, the school committee several years ago gave me the ability to do um, spot start, redistricting right. when students enter a building. So kindergarten or families moving in, and if they're within two miles of another school, to try to balance class sizes, and, and when you look at the enrollment and class sizes, I've tried to do that to try to keep it in that 18, 22, or mid-20s, depending on the grade span. Um, once they're in a building, I don't have the ability to move them somewhere else. Yeah, and I wasn't suggesting that. I was just thinking, well, moving forward. Um, the other question is, is, as I'm looking at this, I remember it was some years ago. It wasn't when um, the Compass program was called DLC. It was at Barrows, right? And Correct. Then it was, so what, what happened, we actually made a, a swap. So if you remember at the time, there was a section of students that were going to Birch Meadow right. um, <laughs> that were in the library area and they would then go to Birch Meadow and there was about less than 10 percent each year they would end up going to Parker when they hit grade five and everyone else went to Coolidge and every year parents in that area wanted to go to Coolidge and it created a problem so what we did is we over a five-year period we actually phased the DLC at the time, 
to, Bar to Birch Meadow and that area um, around the library uh, to One Barrows. So it was a, a switch. Right. What I was getting at is, is it, it's correct. My understanding, other than learning centers, Barrows has no special ed program. That's correct, because they don't have the space. I mean, I, I just didn't know if another school, like I was just thinking, well, if Compass is growing so large and another school might have more space and more configurable, like, like Bridge isn't as big as Barrows, as I understand, right? I mean, Bridge isn't as big as Compass. Like, it would never be an, a reasonable option if you didn't get your later solution, and I know what's coming, and I think it's a good idea. But if, if that doesn't work out, if town meeting doesn't give you the money, could you just say, oh, what if we swapped Compass and Bridge because Joshua Eaton's got bigger rooms and it'd be easier to divide? Uh, that wouldn't work. So correct me if I'm wrong, Lisa Marie, not to put you on the spot, but uh, Bridge program is two classrooms? Yeah. Two classrooms. Compass is two classrooms right now in a third smaller space. Okay, yes, that's why I was just thinking Compass has, you were saying third and then going to four. We, I'm not pushing it on that. I was just no, wondering the, the, if it's a well, bigger... Well, plus then you also have to look at where the, where the students go after they leave elementary. So Compass feeds into Coolidge. And what was happening with Barrows is at Compass, the students at Compass, they, all their peers were going to Parker, but they were going to Coolidge. So that created a problem. So it's uh, I, yeah. So it's better. Yeah. So we what we want to we want our programs to feed into the to the middle school they're going to. So it couldn't really work to try to split compass between two really. schools if it just grows and grows so big. Well, the problem is we don't have the space. Yep. We have no empty classrooms in the district. We don't. Other other buildings have more modulars room, I guess. But I I appreciate it. Thank you. As a point of clarification, we do have compass at two schools. It's two different disabilities. It's, it's, yeah, I, it's one of the things that uh, Dr. Stice has said, we need to change that. We need to change the seat. Compass W, Compass B. Just to add to this discussion, because that was an interesting conversation, but the idea that, and the fact of the matter is that Barrows, Eaton, and Killam, three or four years ago, we had capacity. So we know those schools are at capacity, because three or four years ago, we had to put two modulars at each of them, and they've been used every year since. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there clearly isn't space at those three schools, because just in the last five years, we had to add two classrooms at each that have been used. So it doesn't surprise me that there isn't room there, because five years ago, we had a crisis of space at them. Sure. So the, the last piece we want to talk about is the modular piece. And um, what we can, and, and many years ago, and I think it was around 2005, six, there were modulars at Birch Meadow. There were two of them, and they were located um, in this area here off uh, the, I believe this is the 2-3 wing of the school. Um, the, and Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so there is water and sewer hookup already there. It's just capped. Um, it would be, that would be the location to put the two modulars there. Um, the site work prep, we would have to do site work prep, but obviously it would not be as extensive as it would be if we were trying to put modulars um, at a school a few years ago, like uh, Barrows, where we had to do much more extensive site work because uh, it didn't exist uh, from previous times. So the recommendation that we would have, and we can't put a third modular because this is a very tight access point for uh, fire safety. Um, so it really would be difficult to put another modular classroom uh, on this site without doing more extensive site work uh, in the wooded area. And then you have a distance between the modulars and the actual school, which is something you don't want either. Um, so what we're recommending um, at this point, and again, we do not know an exact cost. This is an estimated cost. We will have firmer numbers uh, in the next uh, week or so, um, is to install two modular classrooms at Birch Meadow um, and then build one classroom at Wood End. Um, and as I said before, we're looking at a couple of options there. We're estimating this is about uh, $750,000. We've had discussions with the town manager, um, and you heard it last night also um, at the financial forum, that this would come out of uh, free cash. This would not be borrowing. This would, this would come out of uh, free cash. Um, and 
we're also recommending that this be done at uh, November town meeting because the timeline to uh, order and get the design for modular classrooms is, is, is lengthy. When we did this a few years ago, we had a special town meeting in February. And if you remember, we still had a month into the school year, we had kindergarten classes in the gym. So um, to avoid that at all costs, I think January would be the time that we would have to, actually we would have to go out to bid probably in late December, early January to do this right and get, a, get it hopefully on time. Um, so November town meeting makes the most sense rather than having a special town meeting in January mm -hmm. and risk trying to get a quorum and um, other factors. And I think, yeah, that's it. The, oh, there is one other piece I wanted to add um, that when, in the, some of the meetings that I've attended with, with Gnap, he said something that was uh, really st stuck with me about you know, ideally, you want 80% of your classrooms, at, you want to be at 80% capacity in your schools. So that when you have a bubble come through, or you have to add um, a, a, an additional special education program, or, you know, you have more students uh, for a full day kindergarten or something like that, you have a swing space. We have no swing spaces in our district. Um, you know, we rely on uh, changes in enrollment at grade levels to get our swing space, which is always difficult to do. Yes. I'll ask the potentially unpopular question. Mm -hmm. um, going back to your, your slide that included all of the growth by program and they agreed to that one. That one, yep. Um, 14 full day kindergarten classes. Mm -hmm. Back when we had five, we had the lottery. And maybe not the popular question, but. Yeah, we did. We did. We absolutely had the lottery. Yeah. The, there was a lot, it was before I was superintendent. Um, yeah, it, it was, I think it was around 2005, yes. So, and, you know, the lottery was removed or, you know, the, the request for more full day happened and, and whatnot. And almost the, the current letters almost seem like if you don't go full day, you may not get your home school, and therefore, if you want your home school, you have to choose full day. Um, and so, you know, just to make sure we're having the conversation, is it even feasible that we reconsider whether or not we need to put a lottery in place? And if we did that, how much space would we reclaim as a result of going back from 14 to maybe, say, 10 full day kindergartens, two in each, in each building, and then going half day for Else. Are you asking me or? I'm asking and I'm looking to the rest of the board and potentially the public for that, that feedback and commentary. So I can give you my educational perspectives because I think that's what my job is. Um, so from an educational standpoint, it would be going backwards. Um, the curriculum frameworks for kindergarten, you know, essentially you need, you need the experience of the time to be able to give the full experience of all the subject areas. Um, so to adequately teach the curriculum, I mean, the ideal situation is to have tuition-free full-day kindergarten for all students. That's many districts. That and we are one of the few many districts now that do not have that. Um, so we would be going backwards instead of forwards with that, and it solves the problem for kindergarten. But those kids come back in first grade because what's going to happen is that families need full-day kindergarten. That's a fact. They will send their children to private kindergarten, and then we're going to have the, the population bubble in first grade that we're going to be dealing with the space issue. Well, I'll acknowledge that they will come back in first grade, absolutely. Yep. The number doesn't change, um, really. But the reality is you're taking you know, one full day classroom out of four of the, the buildings, and it's available for other needs. For that, and they will come back <coughs> there in first grade no matter what, 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 what we do. <coughs> right? So that's really kind of a straw man argument. But, um, and I'm not saying I'm, a, I'm in favor of this necessarily. No, it's a legitimate have question. To explore it as part of this conversation where we just put the, the ticket down for $750,000. I'm just saying, educationally speaking, it's not good for kids. Can, can, and maybe 
this is to one of the two yep. of you. Can one of the two of you explain, and I, we used to have, we had a presentation maybe two or three years ago that showed what can be done in full day versus what can be done in half day. Um, and this doesn't even account for things like there's not enough recess in a half day situation for kids to get out and breathe, much less do the curriculum. But if I remember right, there's like a difference in science or something else that can't be accomplished in half day that is accomplished in full day or? Do you want me to answer? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think that what we've always said in Reading is that our, and we know this, our kindergarten teachers do a great job. We do have half day classes in the district. Um, and by no means am I gonna say that those kids are getting short you know, shorted the time. I think real learning in early childhood takes practice and practice takes time. So what I've always said when families, I've lived in Reading most of my life, as you know, and my son was part of that lottery in 2005, and PS did not get into full day. Uh, and we, out of district, went to Wood End uh, where there was space for full day. What I've always said to families is if you want to do half day, knowing where we are educationally and what the standards are, you have to commit to doing that learning and that practice in your own home or with, you know, within your family structure. There are some families that can do that and will do that. Their family dynamics allow for it. If you can't do that, whether you're a stay-at-home parent or not, then you really need to, to send them to full day and figure out that. Because the reality is to get to first grade, we are going to expect those hours of practice. And that includes multiple learning opportunities. So yes, the standards are the standards, and half-day kindergarten does a great job of addressing that. But that rich practice that really is required for all students, especially our youngest learners, is so important. And the achievement gap, we know this to be true. By third grade, that's real, right? We have those kindergarten, first grade, second grade years are really important. And the more time, as John said, we're one of the few districts that doesn't offer free full day kindergarten. And there's a, a myriad of reasons for that, mostly funding. Uh, it would cost a tremendous amount of money to do that. And space. Um, but to say that we want to go back to a lottery and have five, I, I, as an educational leader and an early childhood expert, I would say a hard no on that. I, I think the other important point and you'll see this when we give you the full presentation. All the assumptions, and we heard this from the committee last year when we were charged to move forward with this elementary space and planning, is was assuming that we would have full day K for all students at yeah. some point. So all of the space analysis, the countless hours of work that's been done on the different options moving forward. I'm not just talking about this piece, I'm talking about the full elementary study. It's been the assumption that full day K was in the plans. Mm -hmm. If it isn't, that means that everything, all the work that's been done for elementary playing is going to have to be relooked at. Yeah. So I think you're right to bring it up as a conversation, but my reaction to it is very similar to Dr. Doherty's, which is the world looked very different in 2005. Yeah. The curriculum frameworks were completely different. Um, and it, it it sort of brings up a vision question for this board, you know, where, where, where we as the elected leaders want to bring this district. And in 2005, I don't know that there were many districts offering publicly funded full day K or optional full day K, or, and if they were, it was probably like writing a subset of a small group of kids were doing it. You know, flash forward 20 years more, um, I think there are states now, correct me if I'm wrong, that mandate it. Yes, so there yes. are states there are. where every kid gets publicly yep. funded mandate. That's the reality in America today. In Massachusetts, the statistics are overwhelming cities and towns that offer publicly funded full day K for all, all kids. So sort of knowing that context of how kindergarten looks today, I do have, I would have a very strong negative reaction to, well, in Reading, we're gonna do something different. We're not gonna do, we're not gonna acknowledge the direction that this is going in, because it's clearly going in the direction of full day K, and when 90% of our parents are opting for it at an exorbitant cost, right. that tells you the demand is there. And when you look at the state and when you look at the country, the demand is there and the need is there. So I think it's a compelling argument. And just to build on what Mrs. Browski said, I think that it's important when we're working on this project, sorry, I'm speaking softly, that when we're working on this project, the short, even the short term, that we're thinking about the potential of 90% of our, our full day desirers wanting, moving to 100% next year. And so thinking to accommodate that rather than shortchange the need now. I think that we need to be thinking 
about full day kindergarten and space for that when we're planning this solution. Because mm -hmm. it's coming. I, I mean, I hear that that other conversation is important. But I think sometimes, like Mrs. Borowski said, we have to make decisions on what's educationally healthy for our kids and not necessarily what's the least expensive alternative or how we can maneuver it financially. We're here for our kids. I, I think the other thing we need to remember is state standards change all the time. They're not getting easier. <laughs> They're getting more advanced. We all know this. One of the things I hear is our kids don't have enough recess time. Mm -hmm. And that's based off the state standards. And if we're looking to roll back to half day and meet the state standards, while I agree this is an absolute subject that needed to come up, it, it also needs to be realized that kids need to be kids. Kids need to have that outdoor time to allow play to build their social emotional skills. And that's the thing I think as adults we forget sometimes. <laughs> um, and those standards are really there. Um, I you look at the standards that are changing on a daily basis in other states, they're growing, they're not going backwards. Mm. Massachusetts is pretty strict with the standards, they're going to grow and get longer. So I think while I agree it is a topic we need to look at, I think we need to look more towards how we're going to effectively use what space we have, grow our space, and, and move forward from that. So just for clarity, right, because um, people are looking at me like I'm <laughs> awful for even asking the question. Um, it was important. <laughs> it was important Maybe to it ask. was the intent, but that's what it felt like. Um, I'm asking the question because I feel like if we're going to put this before town meeting, this body, maybe via Chuck or somebody else as the chair, because this has been such a challenged question in recent town meeting conversations, needs to stand up with a strong statement saying that we fully yeah. and wholly believe we need to do full day gay. And here's why, right? And that's part of the reason why I wanted to have the conversation right now, is so that we could have it publicly, because as a board, we this board, constituted, has not had that conversation. Three of you have been on the board for a while and have had conversations in the past that are similar like that. But if we're gonna to go to the, t the, the, the town body and say we want 750,000, and there's another question I have on that, by the way, um, then we need to make sure that we're ready to take the bullets that are gonna come with regard to the full day kindergarten and whether it's optional, right? Um, and, and be able to document why it's not really optional. Mm -hmm. um, both, both from a you know double income family, my kids both went to full day K, full disclosure, right? So. We opted into that as well, right? So this is not me saying, oh, I'm a half-day kid. That said, I still want the option for half-day kid because I know there's a lot, of a lot of families that still want that too. So we shouldn't mandate, in my mind, full-day kid. There's still parent choice really to things. And kids can get play half-day at home, right? Um, they can get play that way. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make sure we talk about it. And I think from the purpose of this, again, is to say we as a board are supporting full-day kid as a concept. Um, and publicly making that as part of the statement to support which our majority we, we've unwaveringly said for years. I mean, for a while. So uh, we haven't backed up. Yeah. Yeah. I would I would say that's true, but I would say that you know we probably need to say it again. Um, and you know, for lack of a better way, scream it from the rafters and say this is what we support. This is what we're behind, and here's why. And I think the here's why is just as important because I don't know that the here's why has been understood. Fair or unfair. I don't know that the here's why it's been understood. So we in collection with yeah. the administrative team might need to put something together that shows the here's why. Um, that maybe closes it once and for all. It's been out there for a long time. People have been asking it for a long time. If we're going to support it, we should really proactively, for lack of a better way to say, market it that we're supporting it. Um, and then before, if, if anybody else wants to add to that topic, I have another question. But I'll wait for that. Ask the other question. I was Do you have anything different about the I just had a question that if we did say that we want this project to accommodate full day kindergarten, are we there yet with three classrooms or do we need to be considering an additional or more classrooms? 
for this this part step. here is to address the immediate need for next year not the longer okay. elementary five plus year plan this is purely to address a short-term need while we assess the long-term need and does that, that said at the outset of the presentation that it's not, this isn't this isn't meant to just to And, and I heard that, and I understand. My question is, should we be thinking about full day kindergarten at the same time? I know it's a bigger question, but how many more classrooms would that take? And should we be considering about that at the same time? Because next year, we're just thinking about Birch Meadow, but in two years, if 100% of our parents choose full day kindergarten, then some people aren't going to get it. We're going to have to resort to that. I don't, I don't think we're prepared to have that conversation until the report comes out, which is okay. mid-November. Yeah, probably, yeah. It, just to, I mean, to, to make it a simple math problem, although it's not a simple math problem, we, as I said earlier, 30 to 40 students a year are in half day, two classrooms. That's assuming everyone went to the same school, <laughs> which isn't the case. So those students would be spread out among five buildings if everyone had already met. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I think I might be being a little bit redundant, so I'll at least be short. But I think what I'm hearing is that this allows us to keep doing what we're doing. We're not having a larger conversation about where we might want to go in the future. This is just, here's what we've been doing for the last several years. We'd like to keep doing that next year. We need three more classrooms to do that. Just a, a different way of saying the right. same thing. And it's not just full day. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yes, Dr. Carr. Jeffrey Corum, Ridge Road. Uh, after the financial forum last night, I went home and dug through some pictures and found in 2008 pictures of the uh, portables being removed from Birch Meadow <laughs> at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and observed also, I mean, what was interesting I thought was the you know, the chunk of, play, of, of, of the blacktop surface that was taken up by those, um, those portables at the time. And there's a beautiful map there. So while I don't, you know, don't see that there's a better option, it is, you know, I have to say, I'm going to shed a little tear over the loss of the map and <laughs> the chunk of, of, you know, play space for the kids in the wintertime when, you know, you can't go out into the, the non-plowed area unless you're wearing your boots and snow pants. So, you know, on behalf of those Birch Meadow kids, you know, ugh. Ouch, but yeah. <laughs> Our archivist. <laughs> so I hear you, Mr. Quorum. <laughs> um, but I think you point to sort of a, a larger issue, which is why we needed this study and why we absolutely as a community have to have a bigger conversation. Yeah. Because four or five years ago, it was Eaton, Barrows, and Killam, and a crisis of space, and we have to put up modulars. And, and at that time, we were saying, this is a temporary solution. We need to really solve this problem. And this to me is another step in the, yep, this is a temporary solution, but we really need to solve this problem and address issues like the map and the play space and all the things that we would like to have. So I, I think you're pointing to a, the need to have a much bigger conversation, but we absolutely have a problem in September that we need to solve right now. Could, could I just add to that? And it just reminded me of something and sometimes I sound like a historian now, which I never thought I would. <laughs> but I've been here long enough. If you remember, well, Chuck would remember, but we actually started having these conversations in 2010 mm -hmm. when I first became superintendent. We tried to get Wuben Street, which is now uh, apartments. apartments. Um, we tried to build an early childhood center. Um, you know, we, we yeah. did try to solve this earlier, pre-modular, yeah. um, and I know members of the community enter at different points in the timeline, but this has been talked about for a long time now. So I'm gonna, I actually think I have two questions, but the first one might be easiest. And I think with Dr. Doherty, if you'll say Mrs. Dowd might be the right one to answer it. Um, we're asking the town from free cash to give us $750,000. 
I think, and maybe Dr. Dory or Mrs. Kelly needs to answer this first, but I think my understanding is Compass cannot really go into those classrooms. It's to let them stay in the building, in other classrooms yeah, in the we building. Wouldn't, we wouldn't put them in. So those classrooms are likely to be kindergarten, Correct. as they are for yep. other places. So since we have a, uh, about a million dollars in a revolving fund for kindergarten, is there a reason why we can't use that money to pay for this? I can't guarantee. Well, one, it's a capital expenditure, so revolving funds cannot be used for capital. So that's the first issue. And second, I can't guarantee on my cap um, that it will solely be used only for full day kindergarten students, that there will never be another student, a half day student. I can't commit. But that the first part of the Capital answer kicks it right yeah. out. Yeah. So it there, out. there's a host of issues that I cannot use it for. Um, the other question that I was asked, and I'm hesitant to pass it on, but I think I need to, it was asked at the financial forum last night, was would another option be revisiting our policy to bring students, special education students, into our district rather than sending them out and the answer last night was that it would still be more expensive than um, building this new doing the modulars or whatever so is that looking at all of our in reading students in our own programs right and would it be less expensive and save space so to send them out of district looking at this option so it's about 750,000 if, and I'm not a full expert on this, but on average, if you look at some of the least expensive special ed placements, you're looking at 50 to $60,000 for tuition, add another $40,000 for transportation per student per year. So it will not take, and then the other risk is that once you send a student out it is very difficult to get them back in so if you assume you send the kindergarten student out that's 12 years at 90 to 100 thousand dollars a year per student and, and just to add to that the educational benefit of being included in your community in your school we have lots of students and we're always striving for students to be in the least restrictive environment if we remove them to a school that is only students with special needs and significant disabilities, they're not having that option for integration. So there's the financial and education, the right? Softer side mm -hmm. of it as well. Your that just is. I'm the softer side. You're the softer side. <laughs> I'm the softer side. <laughs> Yay! I'm a cold Me too. <laughs> so let me just do some quick math. Let's assume there's ten kids. Oh, it's late. This is gonna be hard. Right? At ninety thousand dollars a kid, that's nine hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. $750,000 in one year one. is less than that. So it already Correct. pays for the, itself in the first yes, year. Yes, totally. And if you do it over nine years or so, you're probably looking at a 12,000% you know, 12, return, 1,200% 12, oh, yeah. return, something like that. Crazy. So it's, yeah. it's almost a no-brainer financially, not to mention the educational benefit. Correct. Of it. Exactly. <coughs> Thank you. I, I feel like you, Mr. Wise, because this was not my question, but it, I wanted it to be. It's an out. understanding that the community is building. You know, Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, no, you don't, he's the one I, I think I think I, I was done. Yes, sorry. I just want to reiterate because we kind of we went very quickly through the why we need this and spent most of this discussion on the what will it be and how much will it cost. So in the event that it that we make a proposal and it doesn't go through and nothing gets funded and we can't do anything um we're looking at significantly large class sizes at that's a Meadow. that's a great question so what would have to happen because we have to have a third special right, education, special education right that so that means i have to take a general education classroom away yeah. um i wouldn't even know where to go with yet yeah, i'd have to talk I mean, to mrs hendricks i'd have to and then that would bump up the class sizes for that grade level I was looking at the smaller, like I was trying to, on the sheet that you gave us with enrollment, try to figure out, it. it's looking mid-20s to me to start, 24, 25 kids in a class. No. Yes. Without any additional kids moving in or any surprise bumps. Right. I mean, I, but I'd have to take a classroom from an existing 
grade level. Yeah. Squeeze it down from three to two. Yeah. And you'd have to get the special education. So, that's even, that's so it's even higher. Yeah. Would be yeah. more than 28. Yeah. And to, to Mr. Wise's point about understanding why full day K, there's another reason why we have to do this, and it's our, our commitment to reasonable class sizes in this district yeah. and equity, which Ms. Dowd spoke about. You know, if we have consistent class sizes across all five elementary schools, roughly as much as we can manage it, um, we can't go into a situation where that's different at a, at a different at one of the schools. I just wanted to make that point. Is there a vote? Yes. <clears throat> Move to request funding in the amount of $750,000 at the November town meeting to address the elementary space needs as outlined in the superintendent's memorandum dated October 17th, 2019. Second. One more question. This may be a logistical question. What comes? What happens if, in the next two weeks, your estimates come in and it's eight hundred thousand, or it's nine hundred thousand? What do we do then? So one of the items I can, I'll speak to part of that. One of the items we did say at financial forum last night and in discussions with the town manager, if the estimates, th there are a couple of things you can do. Correct me if I'm wrong. We can, in theory, pair back and say. If we can only afford to do X portion, you do X portion. So if we price out all three and it comes out higher, we can say we're only going to do the modulars or we're only going to do a modular and a classroom. So we can look at it that way, depending how we put the bid out there. Um, the second option, which we did leave as an open item last night, is if we, we do feel we will have more solid numbers in time for town meeting that if necessary, if we needed to ask for additional, we did leave that option open as well. But once we had the final numbers, we would start here and then make the determination if we ask for additional or we need to scale it back. So, so logistically, we'd be potentially talking about an add-on on the 28th of October or the 7th of November, which is our next meetings, and then FinCon Correct. agreeing to that whenever they mm -hmm. can from their perspective. Correct. So maybe uh, just for purposes of understanding, the 750 is not in the Virginia brain. We did, I, I think I know what it is, but I, I won't want to make a mistake. Two modules represents about 600 of that? Or? Around that with site work, yeah. And then the remaining was for one of the two options, at least one of the options at the uh, wood end. But we're getting pricing on everything, so we're going to have unit pricing so we know exactly how much this is going to cost. <clears throat> so, just to, I guess where my head is, I mean, the priority is two classrooms. The third classroom is based on where we see the numbers trending, where they were six months ago. Yeah. where we think they're going to be next year but you know the number came in the first thing we'd attack would we go down from from one from three, three to two mm -hmm. yeah um another thing we heard last night at, fin at the financial forum was that i think dr Dur you said or maybe mr huggins you said it was that the pri price per square foot for modulars went up from 170 to 250 i want to say uh, since we did Josh Wheaton, Barrows, and Killen? Correct. Um, and this might be what Miss um, Doxter was looking, was looking at here is, are we putting ourselves into a point where asking now for just two plus the other, as opposed to maybe asking for four, we might come back in a year and say we need two more, and then, or, or in two years, mm -hmm. you know? I know we're still working on the projections and we're not trying to solve the long term, but I feel like we might get into a fatigue issue with town meeting if we keep going back, <laughs> right? So would it make more sense potentially to say we're going to ask for a million dollars and if that means we do four classrooms and it gives us a little bit more headroom and less likelihood that we're going to go back to town meeting in less than the three to five years that is currently planned for the NESAC greater we, plan? We don't know what the, oh, sorry, we yeah. know what the uh, full long-term plan is it might include early uh, 
preschool as opposed and not just kindergarten. And it might say we want to have those children in a building as opposed to saying tonight that we want them all to be in modulars because that's that's kind of really what we would be saying tonight if we decide yeah. tonight. That I, I think the other tricky part, and Joe can chime in too, is we're running out of foot space to put the modulus. We're, we're pretty much maxed out at Barrows. Uh, in um, Killam, we probably could do more. Uh, Wood End, I don't know, and it would probably cost more to do modules at Wood End than it would at Birch Meadow because we, you, you'd have to do some significant site work. Um, yeah. So I think the cost of doing two at Wood End or more at Killam or it, it's, it's a significant increase. So then part of, I guess, to my point, uh, sorry, Ms. Yeah. You sure? Um, so to add on to that, it's an interesting idea, but I think the flip side of the risk that you run then is now you're asking for something that you don't actually need in September. And I could see people feeling like, why are you asking something? The, this we absolutely need. The numbers are clear. The story is clear. I understand it. Um, once I would, I would hate to risk not getting the funding for an immediate need because we might need it in a couple of years. I'd actually rather go back to town meeting and say we asked, you know, three years ago we asked for these Killam, Barrows, and Eaton. We needed them. We've been using them ever since. We know we need these. We'll be using them. I, I like the sort of consistency of we only ask for what we really, really need right now until we have a longer term solution. The way you're thinking, I think, is exactly how we have to think when we're talking about the bigger, longer term solution. But for this, I like that it's all an immediate need, and it's very clear. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, just as Marilyn said, I think we have to have a broader discussion about what we want to, you know, do long term and we, and with this committee. I know we've done it with other committees, but uh, I don't think we can do lock ourselves into two more modulars, I, I think it would be then disingenuous to go back to town meeting and, you know, to try to find another solution for that more than five-year plan. Or maybe that solution will be part of it. I just think that that's a, a bigger discussion than the end of mm -hmm. I mean, the only counter and I'll end it here is that we hear a lot that people don't see enough of what's coming and they're not forecasting out enough and so it's like well if you would have told me you needed four I'd have given you four yeah. and now you're telling me you need two and you're telling me you need two you're coming piecemeal and you're so many bites at the apple right I mean so I see both sides and again that's one of the things of having the discussion as a board to make sure that we have that so it's on public record that we have that discussion we're consciously saying we want to do what we need only, right? And we're really saying what we know we need, and that's what we're going to go for. That, that rationale is helping, helpful to me, too, because I think down the road, we don't want to deter the long-term plan because we've got the extra modulars now. So if we're moving towards the long-term plan, as much as I want that full-day kindergarten to be not stymied by a lack of space in less years that we can hope for the big plan. I also don't want to deter the big plan because we have the stopgap in place. So it makes sense both ways, but I really hear the concerns that have been expressed and understand going with what we need now. I, I think the other factor is we don't have a cost estimate yet. So we don't know what it truly costs to do the two modules at Birch Meadow with the site work. So, yeah, no. Could be more. When we take our vote, should we be leaving some wiggle room for the estimate? Like, if should we be voting for 750 plus or minus no, for the plan? That, we worked that out with the town manager, and it came up last night that it's still a, it's the best estimate right now. And so we won't need to vote again. If it changes, you. If the number you changes, we will come back and ask the committee to re-vote, and then we would bring that forth with the committee yeah. to finance committee and then to town meeting. The issue is that for the town meeting in 
Finance Committee, they need to vote on a number. They can't actually vote on a range because we're asking them to fund a number out of free cash. Thanks. Can you remind me of what the time frame is for more solid numbers on this project? Next week. Yeah. So it's, it's close. If the need, it, it'll happen quickly. Yeah. yeah. Delay this vote or re-vote? Rather pre I mean, I was going to ask that it's same fine. question. I mean, there's there's no finance committee meeting between now and November 6th. They might be posting to attend our meeting on October 28th if there's something for them to attend for. If we actually have more firm numbers within a week, which gives us to October 28th, actually minus, you know, October 24th, give or take. Should we table this until we know what the number is we're voting on? So you're right. From a procedural financing standpoint, you're completely right. It's almost six of one, half dozen of another, right? But there's also a community um, communication aspect of this. If we take a vote tonight, we're saying to the community, this is the direction that we are going in, this is the number that we have that's our best estimate now, and we will have more. Like, it's a solid commitment to this plan. I'm concerned that by taking a week to take a vote at all, we're saying, we're not sending really much of a message, and it's a short time to town meeting. There's a, there's a lot of people who need to be aware that this is an issue for next year, that there's a plan in place to solve it, that we're asking for funding. From, from a financing standpoint, I don't think it matters. From a community engagement, and communicating what the will of this committee is, I, I think it's better to take the vote now. And if we have to re-vote a number, we re-vote yeah, a number. So, the, so the, whatever the finance committee votes at this point is not going in the warrant, because that, that's closed. So their, you were there last night, their yeah. feeling is, you know, the sooner they know it, they, they don't want to get criticized by town meeting for dropping whatever the amount is on them at the 11th hour. So if we voted tonight, they'd know about it, be able to vote as soon as possible, and then get some something in writing out to the, yeah. to the town meeting members well in advance of the meeting. Or, you know, that could be Monday night. You know, I'm not opposed to us. You know, I don't want to turn Monday night into a, a whole new debate on, on the options. Mm -hmm. uh, rather just a discussion on a new number, but is that realistic, Joe, the 28th? Be honest. I mean, if I it think the, this, the module is, especially the module is the sooner we move on it, the more likely we are to get a delivery for the start of school, so we have oh, uh, the school we year. can't do anything until after November town meeting, so. Yep. I think the other part too is my understanding based on last night is the 750 is what is going in the warrant documented that it's an estimate finance committee will be voting after school committee so I believe that number is what is going to be in there and then any adjustments would be what they ended up with was that it was going to not be in the major section it was going to be asterisk underneath the section with the point, and then once Finance Committee voted, which the earliest time they were going to vote was October 28th. They're not coming together before that. They made that pretty clear. Um, so the earliest time they would vote would be October 28th themselves, at which point they wanted to send a memo out to town meeting members saying, we did vote this, we agreed to it, you know, now it's in for the conversation. Um, so, I mean, to, to Gene's point, I, I think we're, I mean, I'm, I know I am in, absolute agreement that we need to do this. I'm not in agreement of voting for the money before we know what the money is. So, so I think we could potentially put a motion on the table to say we're supportive of the greater recommendation and pending the financial numbers, which we can finally approve on October 28th. Well, I'll be, I just want to make sure that Joe's going to be able to <clears throat> so when you when we get what we're going to get in a week's time from now is a a more refined ballpark. rough order of magnitude. Two of that number, not the, correct. We know what the module right, but what but what ends up happening is when you get to do um, um, design documents and you get to ninety percent design do documents, that's when you truly refine your cost estimate for any project. And we're going through the same thing right now with the security project. 
that's when you get your final, your final hard and fast number. Um, I'm confident the number we get next week will be w within a range, pretty close of what we think it, we're going to need to spend. But it's really when you design a full project, you, you, and that's when you get the hard and fast. They've they've spent a lot of time and money on looking at the site. They've explored all the options and everything. We, this is fast tracked. It was what we're doing to give you the best number we can. I trust this company. We use them to give us a cost estimate on um, turf, two. Turf, two. turf two and some other projects we've done. Um, but it'll also depend on what the bidding environment is. Right, the bidding is environment well. right now is very volatile, but I think that mm. the 750 will at least get the us calendar. the two, maybe three. But we need to move it along. And another potential benefit of voting the number is we are <coughs> communicating roughly what we expect this project to cost, roughly. Okay. So that's our that's another important communication to the community is this is this is the ballpark we're thinking that this project will cost. In the event that it were to come in astronomically higher, it's kind of good that we voted a number because then we have to have a conversation. I'm I'm in favor of voting for this number and doing it now to give the go ahead and the clout for getting the bids in and getting us moving and giving the message to the FinCom that we are fully behind this. So I'm on that. I'm wondering if by voting on it also we're enabled to plan a meeting to, to focus on this with the public, to invite them in just to talk about this and ask so their questions. No bids are going, nothing's happening until town meeting says you mm -hmm. got the money. Okay. So there's no, this vote tonight isn't going to set Joe off to his new bid. It's not going to happen until, when's the town meeting? November? Mid-November. Mid-November. Mid -November. So, so that's when that happens. Okay. And the first, uh, we had talked about that, about uh, doing a, there'd be a presentation at town meeting because that's who, it's a free cash, so it's not a community-wide decision. It's, it's town meeting's decision. Uh, so. I just think that it's helpful to educate the general public who's communicating with their town meeting members. I realize the vote will be by town meeting members, but the more educated the general populace is, the more support we'll get from town meeting members. And so answering questions ahead of time would just build a ground swell of understanding and support. And that between now and November, we're available to do that at any, any meeting, and, and yes. No, I was gonna speak to two points. Yeah. So the, the first point is, it is not uncommon for this committee to re-vote a capital number after you've already voted, because cost estimates change, things like that. You've done that before. Second is, I believe, both to Dr. Doxer and Ms. Borowski's point, we can start now working on a communication plan yep. if you start, if you vote on it tonight, because to that point, we will have to start educating the Birch Meadow community, yeah. Wood End community, you know, those communities about why we're doing this, what is going to be happening, those types of things. Yes. Um, the motion was moved to request funding in the amount of $750,000 at the November town meeting to address the elementary space needs as outlined in the superintendent's memorandum dated October 17, 2019. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to have a clicker. Let me change it. What are we doing first? The curriculum? Yep. All right, good evening. Uh, next up after that lengthy discussion, um, <laughs> where are, I have uh, members of the learning and teaching team here. Um, I know you've met them before, um, but in case anyone from our viewing audience um, 
hasn't, I'm going to introduce them and maybe they can just quickly tell them, tell you a little bit about themselves. And they're going to be walking us through some important work that they've been doing primarily at the middle school. Um, as I mentioned to you in my report, September and October are really busy months for us and we're doing lots of learning and teaching work in um, PD and curriculum work pre-K to 12. Um, I didn't even mention the pre-K pre-K work we're doing with curriculum guides, which are also happening right now. Um, but the, the tonight is really just about this. Last year I talked about that cur curriculum renewal cycle and I used the analogy of a clock and said when you're like at the midnight, sort of 11 to 1, that that's when we take those curriculum sort of rich times and say, okay, this is why we're doing this now but we're always doing curriculum. Curriculum's the work we do all the time. So they're gonna explain um, why they're, they're talking about these two particular areas tonight, um, because we could really talk about anything. So without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce our STEM coordinator, Heather Leonard, and Allison, our humanities coordinator, and uh, they can just give you a quick, bright, very quick bio, and then move on to what they've been doing, so. Hi, uh, Allison Straker, humanities curriculum coordinator, I'm um, very happy to be here talking to you about this tonight. I uh, was not prepared to do a bio. <laughs> <laughs> Just year two. Working year two, working in Reading and happy to be. So <laughs> I've done a lot of other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, Heather Leonard, STEM Curriculum Coordinator. And we're really excited to share the work we've been doing this year. I think the, the very mini bio that the exciting part is over the last year that we've found a really exciting rhythm and pattern to how we work and I think collectively as a team we've, we've really found a nice way of working collaboratively together and then also working hard to make sure we're supporting the district-wide work so it's been really exciting um, to do that together I think as a group so. Uh -huh. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to start with is this quote, is this idea of a collection of teaching resources is no more a curriculum than a pile of bricks is a house. Often that word curriculum is used and overused and misused. Um, and we wanted to clarify a little bit about when we're talking about curriculum, what do we mean? Um, so when we think about curriculum, we're thinking this is all part of curriculum. So tonight, the reason that I'm here is to share the work that's been taking place in middle school mathematics in the specific area of tools and resources. However, like bricks to a house, tools and resources is the one small piece. You also need to think about when and how and for how long and how will we know if students did it and which methodology we're gonna to use to make sure our students are receiving the information um, how are we checking in in an ongoing way? And how are my students receiving it? And what do I need to adjust per their needs? That's really curriculum. But the piece tonight that I'm gonna speak about in mathematics is that tools and resources piece. Because it is one of the components that when we're looking at curriculum work, we need to consider and do in a thoughtful manner. So just wanted to share this idea that the reason we use terms like curriculum tools or curriculum resources is because we're talking about a small component of the larger work of curriculum work. So the mathematics curriculum pilot included in your school committee packet was a letter that was shared with the middle school parents just to fill them in on the process and the why we're here. So previously our middle schools we're using, um, as one of their primary curriculum tools, we're using a tool called, tool called Digits, um, which is being phased out by Pearson. Um, we still currently have access to this resource, and it is something that our teachers are continuing to utilize. However, it is something that Pearson has shared they're no longer updating. So that was one of the reasons it triggered this, that time to do that curriculum tool uh, evaluation and renewal process. The, the coordination worked well with the alignment to the 2017 curriculum frameworks um, that the teachers have been spending a lot of time getting to know more deeply, understand what does that sound like and look like in the classroom, and then also think strategically about with the shifting in the middle school classes and routines, what do we need to make sure we're well equipped to meet all of the students in our classrooms. So all of these needs really triggered that timing to do an examination of what tools do we need to make sure we have to support students in mathematics. So um, 
one of the things you'll have noticed is we're really only looking right now at seventh grade, eighth grade, and the seventh, eighth accelerated courses. The sixth grade is currently using math and focus as their primary curriculum resource tool, which is a continuation and a vertical alignment with the elementary curriculum. And our algebra, our eighth grade algebra, is still coordinated and connected with the high school classrooms. So this focus on this curriculum tool is primarily on the seventh and eighth grade classrooms, non-algebra classrooms. I wanted to do this quick share because I want to be careful when we're talking about selecting curriculum tools. You will not find any place in this district where anyone's going to say every teacher on Tuesday is on page 12 because that's not realistic, that's not good practice, that's not what our kids need. We also know that you're not going to find one single published tool that does every single thing you want it to do. If that was the case, you could put kids in front of robots, they can receive it and be done. We have certified, qualified, experienced teachers who use their knowledge of the kids in front of them and their experience and training to make great decisions about choices. And the beauty in this day and age when we're talking about curriculum is that there is an incredible wealth of open education resources that are available that many of our teachers draw from. So teachers are still pulling and will continue to pull from many of these resources which are freely available to them to access and utilize on top of the selection of a curriculum tool. So what, what I'm talking about is a common tool that all teachers can have access to that allow them to have some consistent, predictable pacing, um, unit um, development information throughout the grades, and something that all of the students can have access to when it comes to things like an online platform. It is not the only tool. We wouldn't expect that. And our teachers will continue to use the ones they've developed and those freely available to enrich their students' learning. So just a quick caveat. So in December of last year, uh, I had the opportunity to meet with the middle school math uh, professional learning community. And at that time, they were able to share what's working well, they want to make sure they preserve, what are those components of a curriculum they, th they really think they need, both what do they currently use a lot, and what do they wish they had more of. And then they also thought about how would they want the pilot process to go. So they as a group were able to share those things that they would prioritize within the math curriculum tool search. Following that from January through May, a curriculum subcommittee of middle school educators met. And we took that time to take that feedback from the PLC. We took a rubric that is built from the state, the Curate rubric built by DESI. We looked at a rubric that uh, Assistant Superintendent Kelly shared from her previous experiences and others that were available and we use that to build an analysis rubric that was based on really deeply analyzing the different tools as it relates to personalizing it to ready needs and what we know is good practice based on a lot of the research that's out there. We then built timelines of what we wanted to do and how long and then we applied that rubric to a wealth of curriculum tools. Any curriculum tool we analyzed we had at least two different reviewers so that there was multiple data points that we could calibrate across. Um, and then we were looking deeply at what are those components that we wanted to make sure we had in place. Which was a lot of work and the team was outstanding, by the way. <laughs> um, so following that, um, the team made a recommendation of the two, two curriculum tools that they wanted to consider. Then we had a newly established team of new folks, some that participated in the subcommittee and others that were participating in this council. And, I was able to receive a grant from the state to pay for this work over the summer, which was really exciting. It's their high quality instruction uh, grant, which is exciting. And we met for, I think it was three full days, and we actually sat together and we met with the publishers from each of the tool to look critically. We asked really great questions. We had a technology integration specialist there who could ask how is this going to work on our systems and platforms? How does it talk <coughs> with other things? We had a special education teacher there who was able to ask for some really specific um, components of it, classroom teachers and administrators. So it was a really fantastic team. Um, and what this team did was not only got ready to think about what the tool was and, and basically building internal building experts, then they were also to think of able to think about what should this pilot routine look like. So they took the pacing guides components of the curriculum that already existed and then looked at the tools we were piloting and said we're going to do a unit based pilot. Traditionally pilots will often happen that Miss um, Smith will pilot 
this curriculum A, Ms. Jones will pilot curriculum B, and then we'll see what they thought about it and decide. The problem is that conversation often leads to apples versus oranges, so you don't have a shared experience. Um, and it also doesn't necessarily lend it to having sort of a, a comparison for individual teachers. So it's, it's harder to think collect, collectively um, about two different tools when your experience might only be with one. So what we did was actually identified units that were between four and six weeks units that were already part of their pacing guide. And then this team actually went into the curriculum tools and pulled out which of those modules or lessons within those units aligned with the pacing guide that already existed. One school started with a curriculum tool and the other school started with a different one. And actually um, right now, um, we're in the middle of the swap. So they're going to trade. So all teachers participating in the pilot will have the experience and exposure to all tools. And while they're doing this, they're completing ongoing feedback and data sheets to say their experience with planning, with availability of resources, with accessibility of texts, with their need to differentiate or change. Anytime they have to supplement a lesson, meaning it didn't meet what they would have needed to, either to support the range of learners in their room or with prior knowledge, that's all being captured. So we have this rich, real-time data that's about the teacher's experiences with the pilot. So, oh, oops. Uh, that's this. So, <laughs> so this is what we've been doing now. Um, so the teachers have been doing this work that was planned by the Curriculum Council this summer. They did receive a training and our uh, middle school principals will principals were incredibly supportive in making sure that teachers could take time during one of the days to meet and have a long block of time to make sure that they could get into the resources they understood and they all experienced both so they knew what they were working on and what was coming um, and they're collecting that feedback data as I mentioned. So the sketched outline of the <coughs> pilot window is from September through the end of November to do those pilot units. However, the beauty is we continue to have access to these resources in an ongoing way. So teachers can continue to try, sample, utilize different components of them as they go and really think critically about what, what am I looking for, who has what I need and, and who doesn't and what does that mean for me. So what's next? So we're going to take that data that's been collected over the pilot and analyze it. Um, the teachers are actually going to connect together on the PD day on the 5th of November and have a check-in. Where are we? How's it going? Is there anything we need to connect about now? Ideally, we'll be making a recommendation about what that next step might be and go through the procurement process for those resources. Now, you'll notice I'm talking about this mid-year. There's a lot of intentionality with that. Often, people will do a pilot time. They'll get the things, and then September, you start off and you have to use the thing. But strategically, what we have here is a beautiful overlap window that will continue to have access to the digits curriculum throughout the end of the school year. We also have access to these curriculum tools we've been piloting. So whichever tool we'll decide to go with following that pilot process, students are already enrolled, they have accounts already set up, teachers have the physical resources available to them from the pilot, so we can start to build in and phase in those without it being a dramatic all one or all of another, which can also include strategic plans for training and ongoing professional development throughout that adoption process. So it won't have to be a dramatic shift, um, but can be really intentional and done in strategic ways as a curriculum group. Which then again lets us go back to moving away from it being just about the tool to us strategically planning and thinking about that progression of learning in mathematics. Talked kind of fast, but that's where we are. are there, do you want me to stop for questions yeah, now? Well, yeah. Before we yeah. move on to social studies, are there any questions about um, either from the audience or the committee? Yes. <laughs> Taking questions as I go. So. Um, so, first of all, I want to say, overlap window, big, big fan. Awesome. That was probably one of the single biggest problems we had when Myth was rolled out, was it was big bang and nobody knew how to use it. So, big lesson learned. Thank you for applying it. Um, with that said, I have a couple of questions around some of the cost related things. Sure. Um, I tried to go back after receiving that letter as a middle school parent <laughs> um, and after some other conversations and try to see where the funding for this actually was. Um, and it's not called out in the budget for 1920. Um, so I'm wondering if 
pilot-wise, it's free for the first year, and then we are going to see the budget request come in for the 2021 um, funding for the, the, the tools in question. Great question. I can speak to the first part. Normally, pilot tools are not free, and that was part of the incentive for writing the grant. Thankfully, the publishers have been incredibly accommodating, so that has been a wonderful thing. So that is a cost a fun cost saving. Um, but yeah, I can let um, Assistant Superintendent so, Kelly speak to the actually, year. Actually, we did put in some curriculum funding for this last year. I don't think it said specifically math. It said curriculum updates. Um, I checked with Gail. That question came up at some point, maybe over the summer, about that. But we fully knew that our curriculum money this year would go to social studies and to middle school math. So we're hoping that the money that we budgeted for and we, we haven't gone through procurement we don't know what the costs are we're hoping that the pilots have been incredibly kind to us we're hoping although um, to add with that the hope part of what we had is that uh, when assistant superintendent what assistant superintendent kelly was planning for those curriculum updates she did have a number and a window so part of this initial part of the step of this process was when asking for the one of the very first things that was asked for before even applying rubrics was what would that per pupil, pupil cost be annually what is the actual purchase cost for any hard things and anybody that was far beyond what would be sustainable was not evaluated so if there were some that were far too expensive from what could be purchased with the given budget those were not then taken to that next step because what we didn't want to do is evaluate something that we could not afford to actually purchase and secure so thankfully that actually only limited one item um, so we were really and it, that was more on that online, ongoing um, license piece of it. But again, the beauty is so many of these have, there's a lot of open ed resources that continue to be free that can support. So um, it was a, not a huge loss of potential evaluation tools. Um, so I guess the reason why I asked the question um, is a procedural slash policy related reason. Um, and I don't think we're going to ever decline what you guys propose. So it's not me saying, you know, the answer to this is going to be no necessarily, but technically by policy, the only approval this body has of any curriculum materials is budget approval. Um, and that's the reason why I'm asking the question, because if the budget is there from an evaluation perspective, that's one thing. The budget for actually purchasing specific materials should be, in my mind, specifically called out so this body can specifically approve it for policy. Um, so I just that's a logistics issue, and maybe we can bring it up as part of the 1920 or 20, 2021 related budget process so we can specifically approve it. Um, but I, I think that's an, an important process of what the policy actually says written is our approval of curriculum is budget approval. Sure. Um, so that's just a note. Um, now the other question is, if I could just speak to that, I think one of the challenges you have is with any given um, resourcing piece is that curriculum is not just the tool acquisition. And often when you're thinking about a curriculum acquisition, it's not one, one resource. It's thinking about professional development. It's thinking about training. It's thinking about licenses. And again, from most curriculum areas, you're pulling from multiple tools and resources. And that's often developed over time as teachers continue to learn and adapt and develop their maps and work with their building principles and work with certified experts that come in to do that coaching and supervision. And as they're doing that curriculum outline and thinking where and, and doing that data analysis, where are we meeting these students and where do we need to think about other potential curriculum tools, thinking strategically about that. So it's often, it, it curriculum procurement of tools happens less often in this large, bigger size purchase and more often in an ongoing and fluent way as we meet our kids' needs. So. I, I mean, I completely understand that and I agree with that. I'm just, again, <coughs> somewhat of a policy point to it. Sure, so, yeah. Um, and I guess, and I don't want to monopolize this, there's a question or a thing, but can you talk a little bit to the online versus textbook related yes. stuff? And one of the big upro up uproars right now in middle school is that they don't have a textbook to bring home because we don't have enough for, apparently for the kids to bring I mean, the digit books home for the year and that's not setting right with some parents. So can you talk a little bit about that and what accommodating factors can we put in place in the sure. meantime or anything else along those lines? Sure. I can certainly speak to that question. I can't speak to digit books in the past so that I'm not familiar with. Part of what we're 
including in the pilot, is which components of the different curriculum tools you're using and how frequently. There's a lot of perspectives out there about where we are and where we want students to go when it comes to utilizing curriculum resources and tools. A big reason a lot of the curriculum tools that are being vetted have a rich online component is because we know curriculum changes, we know it continues to update, we know we want to keep it current. And when you invest in a textbook, that tends to be a tool, a piece that you invest, and then you don't rebuy those year after year. So the question is, based on the content area, based on what our students need, based on availability of resources, which components of the curriculum are we using to teach students? Which ones do we need? Um, and a bit of that evaluation includes, is it a hard cover text? Is it a consumable student workbook? Is it that online subscription to the online platform and tools? Is it all of the above? Does it depend on seventh, eighth grade? Does it depend on eighth? So all of that is being considered as part of the evaluation is which pieces of the components are needed to make sure the students have everything they need and the teachers have everything they need to meet the students where they are and teach the standards. So that's part of what we're evaluating is which of the pieces are important to make sure we acquire. Because so many curriculum tools have, you can get this additional workbook and you can get this additional assessment book and you can get, so that's a bit of what we did. So when we were getting the tools for the pilot, what was asked for is a classroom set so that students could get their hands on it. So every teacher has a set of 30, but it just means that there's not enough for each individual student to take one home because we also want to be mindful and respectful of conservation and if it's something we're going to use for a month and then throw away hundreds and hundreds of books, that's not responsible either. So we did take that into consideration to make sure they have access to it, but that's part of what is being evaluated in that data cycle. Hi, Mary Ann Downing, Heather Drive. I'm going to build a little on what Mr. Wise said because I have a child undergoing the pilot in Math 7-8 who had a test yesterday and we were trying in the pre preceding days to access the online tools and find practice problems and maybe it's the one they're using right now at Parker but it's extremely tedious. Mostly it's videos that are trying to give you something you can find. There's I have used the digits book with my son previously and there's a lot more practice problems so I hope you can take that into account that I, I think don't just ask the teachers, ask the kids because it's kind of frustrating and I'm having to go online and say, well, what unit are you doing? Let's, let me find you some practice problems because she has no book. Her binder only has a few handouts. And the online content, there's colorful lessons and things to read to you. And, and, but it's not, it's not a lot of practice work. In math, you build mastery through repetitive doing problems in practice. And lastly, I leave you with, I can understand history books, biology books, there's content changing, new discoveries, but at the level of middle school math, math is math. And how you find a cube root now is how you found a cube root you know, 15 years ago. And so I just like to, I'd, I'd, I could urge you to find something with a tangible textbook that doesn't just help the kids, it helps the parents. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up, Marianne. I think that's a key important portion of this is that feedback that we hear from families and from parents. And that was one of the pieces that really came through in that initial um, brainstorming from the classroom teachers was they wanted resources that families would have access to at home. So there are some uh, other online resources that didn't have either web-based or tangible resources that were sent home, they were more teacher resource bins. And the Reading teacher said, our families want to have access. So that is something that they heard. And in an ongoing way, that's something that for sure we'll continue to make sure is addressed, is that our students, in fact, actually I received a feedback form this week that somebody had wrote it. A student was really struggling with homework and there was, they were having glitches with the platform. I mean, I own the fact that I'm asking our families and our students to go through three different platforms, their familiar digits, and the two pilot. And so that is difficult and clunky and complicated. And so there, uh, there's a bit of that lack of smoothness that's on the design of the pilot. So that's, that piece is, is certainly owned um, by me. The goal in not doing it for too long was that it wasn't, it was something that we can make sure the teachers can accommodate for and having the familiar platform. 
um, and also make sure that it wasn't something somebody was stuck in a place that they didn't feel they had it. But what you're bringing up is a really good point is that that tangible book is not just for the teacher to deliver the content. It's a, it could be a supporting resource for a student at home. And that again is a piece we're evaluating. Though I will challenge that idea that math is math because the way that I learned how to do certain math is very different than the way we're thinking about math. Um, and so I, I just want to be mindful of it's not just the content. There's a lot of content in mathematics or in science that is the same. But the way we're thinking and learning and practicing does look and sound a little different. Um, so yeah, we need to find that sweet spot of having access to resources, making sure our parents, families, and students feel that they have what they need, um, but also to make sure that we're staying current in our practices. So. And one more point or a lesson learned. <coughs> one of the other lessons learned from MIF um, was that the online resources were almost never used. Um, whether it was login related issues or whatever else, we had kids that went through it for four years, five years. On the digital. Not once was it used, right? And I think Marianne actually had to go hack other, other districts' websites to find the links to MIF online and share that with other parents <coughs> around them. Because we, for one reason or another, couldn't. And then even that, they never used it, right? So I think there's a, there's a want to stay ahead, and I think that's great. But there's a practicality of how are we going to use it, how are we going to support it, that we also very much need to make sure is clear and concise. Agreed. Um, and I'll just add this one last thing, as you guys consider the cost, and another reason why it comes back to us from a budget <coughs> perspective. You, set, you hit on that renewable workbook. That renewable is the cost that ultimately we end up having to say yes to. So I'm all for that concept, but that's the reason why that kind of thing comes back to us from a cost perspective. Sure. Thanks. All right. So switching gears, um, I know the new social studies curriculum has gotten a lot of press this year. So uh, Allison's going to lead you through what we've been doing at primarily middle school, although it's pre-K to 12, everything has to be uh, renewed in the next year. So um, we're definitely starting with middle school, which had the most changes. Thanks. So for social studies, why middle school social studies? Brand new frameworks. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have a choice. And it made sense to start with middle school because that's where the bulk of the changes happened. Um, this is just copied from the vision of the frameworks. Um, not a lot changed content-wise, I think. What really changed was the intention. So in the new frameworks, what you see is a lot more literacy, reading and writing within the content area. You also see practice standards. What does it mean to be a historian, to live um, live a life like a social scientist? What does it mean to be a citizen? So this more idea of how do we practice social studies is much more a part of um, the 2018 framework. So for six and seven specifically, we saw a shift from separate history and geography courses to combined um, classes that have to do with looking at cultures in the past and in the present. So how does a culture's history inform what it looks like today? And how does the geography of that culture um, play a part in that? So we are looking at a six and seven that combines history and geography and really is just now separated by regions of the world. And for eighth grade, we have an entirely new course, civics. Uh, the eighth grade course really changed radically. It's basically being built uh, from the ground up. And this isn't unique to Reading. It's being built across the state. Um, and what we have been lucky enough to be a part of are all these great collaborative opportunities. The state has offered lots of networks so that I am able to meet with leaders from other districts, um, with uh, content experts. The vendors and the publishers are all sort of scrambling and, and wanting to create resources for us. So it's been a really cool opportunity to see this new course being built. And of course, we're going to be, it's all going to lead to the civics project that is going to be something that's completed by all eighth graders across the state. So that little graphic that you see, oops, um, <coughs> is those three things sort of put together. Um, the three pillars is what they're calling them at DESE. 
uh, standards for content, standards for literacy within that content, and then standards for practice. So how do all of these three things fit together? It's really the essence of the 2018 framework. So this information comes directly from sort of the plan that was laid out in what we were going to do and what action steps that um, I, along with the teachers and Assistant Superintendent Kelly, took to start this process. So if you remember, this process all started um, right around the time that I got hired. So it was ready to go. Um, so I spent a lot of that initial time really acclimating myself to this brand new framework that actually wasn't even officially published until I think October. Um, and really going and seeking out any opportunities that I could to network with other, other districts. And like I said, that has really been a really great thing that um, we've had support in. Uh, we applied for a grant similar to what uh, Heather did for mathematics to support this sort of um, teachers getting together, to support these meetings, to fund that kind of thing, to, um, to support the revision. We started looking for a consultant in the spring because we wanted to ensure that we had a content expert alongside us as we thought about how to bring this to teachers. So as part of that networking opportunities that I had throughout the fall and winter, I met a lot of really great and smart people. So we brought on a consultant who is a, um, a leader in Stoughton Public Schools, who's doing a lot of work um, with the revision, and she supported uh, me as I brought this work to teachers. And so the goal of the spring work was to create pacing guides. What are our units gonna look like? What are sixth and seventh gonna look like next year? So we're in a bit of a spot where sixth right now is changing, is following this new unit guide, this new <laughs> framework of um, history and geography combined. And seventh is doing sort of not the old way because it changed, it changed <laughs> because of what sixth grade had feeds into seventh. So next year we'll have sixth and seventh doing the full on new framework and eighth grade as well. So we had scopes and sequences that were finalized, which means what are the topics we're covering and when, and uh, we had those by May and June of last year, of this year. So throughout this summer, we had um, opportunities for teachers to take part in curriculum writing, so taking those unit plans and really making them more specific. Uh, what are they gonna look like? What's that gonna look like in the classroom in actual practice? So that was the work that was done during the summer. Uh, right now, we are, I've just scheduled, a few weeks ago, we're having um, professional development with National Geographic so that teachers can really become more acclimated to the online component. Um, those textbooks arrived over the summer. So I'll circle back to that. Um, we did invest in National Geographic. Uh, because this was a new framework, there weren't a lot of resources. There were not a lot of options. And our teachers were very uh, adamant that, I won't say adamant, it's a little strong, but uh, very much wanted uh, a textbook for a resource. And National Geographic is National Geographic, and they were the only publisher, really, that was offering all the resources that would let, um, let us combine the history and geography because what we've had historically are history books and geography books, so not this sort of integrated model of thinking about cultures. So National Geographic was offering a way of doing that. We also uh, had Newzella, which is a strictly online platform. We spent a lot of time looking into what they had to offer because a lot of districts uh, in our area are using them. Uh, ultimately, it was decided by the teachers primarily that because we're not a one-to-one -one district, it, it didn't seem feasible enough for that to be our primary resource. And that's, I think, a fair point, um, to have only an online resource, strictly. Uh, and so that's what's happening right now. What's gonna happen as this year continues, the teachers are gonna work through this process. They're gonna s teach these scopes and sequences, teach these units, and really what I've asked them to do is sort of make note, how is it going, how does it go, how does it feel, because this is an ongoing process that's gonna be revised. So they're gonna have training um, with National Geographic and those components. 
They're spending some time on the November PD day uh, sort of collaboratively planning and talking about how it's going because I think what we want to also ensure is a uh, shared experience across both schools. And the next steps will be to really step back and think about do we have everything that we need in order to teach uh, not only 6th and 7th but the 8th grade civics course as well. And um, how are we going to ensure that we're integrating the literacy and practice standards as intended by the new framework? So when, are you, I'm sorry, are yep. So back in the budget process, we talked about this a lot, the yep. civics and the, the big part of that discussion was the, what were the curriculum resources going to be? I think what I'm hearing now tonight is after, from basically it came down to National Geographic and that's it? So, so far that's all we've had. So sixth and seventh are gonna be utilizing the National Geographic. As Allison said, we, we had a very old history book and um, primarily seventh grade did geography. This is a collaborative uh, resource. A lot of districts had, had already started looking at it. We kind of jumped on that and we got a really good price so we, we got it for sixth and seventh grade. The eighth grade is still, we're still working on it. We do have some teacher resources. We have class sets of We the People. We have a few other things. They're really, none of the publishers have published a civics book for eighth grade yet. Um, that's part of where all this networking comes in. So what, we've, what we're working on is those curriculum guides and really mapping out what the units will look like, talking about those resources or tools that we'll use for this year while still investigating do we need to continue to look at other resources? I will be guaranteed to you that in another year, there's gonna be plenty of uh, paid resources, books that are gonna be available. They just haven't, honestly, they're, they're, not, they're not done yet. That's just, that's outrageous that the, that happened at the, the I know it's not. Yeah. It, that, was, that was a lot of the discussion. You got a whole cohort of kids mm -hmm. that's kind of just, you know, but going by. Well, right now. so yes and no, um, Mr. Robinson. I think, so what's nice about this is because we haven't done our curriculum guides at the middle school and we're working on them now, is we have a great opportunity to really outline our units, sort of pace them out. The units are very clear. The new frameworks are very specific. So it is going to require more tools. I mean, we have a team going somewhere next week. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're constantly doing PD. They're sharing resources from other communities. We spent a whole day in Newburyport looking at their civics project. So like, yeah, we're doing a lot more legwork, whereas if there was something published, we could use that and do some of the tools. Whereas right now, everything, the tools, we're sort of starting from scratch or looking at what other districts are using. It is definitely a lot of work, but it's also really exciting. I think our eighth grade team um, at both schools are really excited and at Coolidge because they loop we have seventh and eighth grade teachers kind of invested in this too because some of them will be teaching eighth grade next year I mean I'm not going to say that this is going to be the final eighth grade curriculum we may continue to add to it um, but for this year I think we're kind of excited about it it's brand new it's exciting the kids love it um, and I think that's the whole purpose is to raise engaged citizens and this kind of dovetails into the next topic. Do you have any insight into discussion at the state level about a statewide assessment in the area of social <laughs> studies? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Nothing that I Fair would um, state as sort of official, um, but there is definitely buzz, I will yeah. call it, at these network meetings that there will be someday uh, a test or some sort of assessment not necessarily a test is what I've heard, and this is all just sort of hearsay, uh, but it will be in eighth grade, I think, is, is we can count on that. If there will be one, it will be in grade eight. The DESE, the DESE folks are saying that they are still committed to a recap and, and assessment. The last thing I think that I heard was that someone was hired to start working on this at the state level. I don't know if that's true. That's we heard, heard that they're, put, they're putting it out to bid, so we were hoping that it might be dovetailing with the project and having almost like a portfolio assessment. Yeah. If right. they're hiring companies to, to build a test, that looks less likely. Thank you. Thanks. Any other? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Oh, we are. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> So
So um, I know it's late, and um, <laughs> the last topic of the night, I don't. I think this is the last topic of the night, right? Um, is the MCAS uh, overview, and I, I want to. I really want to focus on the word overview. <laughs> um, you know, having spent many hours, and and really could have spent way more hours on MCAS scores, and really looking at them at 2018 and 2019, which is really the view that we can look at them. Um, as I think you probably remember from last year, for those of you who were part of it, um, well, tonight we're going to talk about the accountability report. We're going to talk about new MCAS updates. Um, we're going to talk about the results at the 5,000 foot view primarily by grade um, and by section. So three to eight is a section, high school is a section. That's how state does it now. Um, and then we're going to talk about next steps because to me that's the really important work is how does this data inform what we do. So um, as I said to you last year, they changed the accountability system. Um, no longer do we have, you know, uh, levels. Everything is on this continuum. They actually even changed it from last year. So <laughs> it, looked, it used to look different. Um, now that whole middle blue um, is their uh, schools not requiring intervention. And it goes all the way from schools of recognition, which I think there are 70, 72. I was going to say 74, but thank you, Lisa Marie. 72 schools of recognition. And then everyone else, primarily 85% of the districts are in that next section. And the good news is that we're, we're really all in that section. Um, meeting or exceeding targets, substantially, um, substantial progress towards targets, moderate progress, um, limited or no progress, luckily we don't have that, and no focused target support. Um, and overall as a district, we were at 66 partially meeting targets, which you noticed isn't even there anymore because they've already changed that. Um, it makes me wonder what they're gonna change for next year. They keep saying this is the last change and then they change it um, to 68% per per substantial pro progress. So we actually kind of moved up a little bit on the continuum as a district, which I think is very good news for us, um, especially since we, didn't, we had no idea what the next generation high school test would look like. Uh, there was really nothing uh, for us to really look at. So when we look at accountability, and we talked a lot about this last year, and all of this is very complicated. There are many, many, many pages on DESE's site on how they sort of skewer things as far as this counts for this and this counts for that. Last year's scores count for this and this year's scores count for that. But really from the high level, what you need to know is that achievement, that's like our kids' scores, right? Um, how did they do? Where are they? And then student growth, that's how much they've grown compared to other peers that got the same test scores that they did. So we don't have growth in third grade. We have growth in fourth grade. We have growth in fifth grade. What's kind of cool about this is that growth goes on. So when you have, and now we're only in year two, but moving in ahead, when you get them to, by the time they get to 10th grade, their growth is, is really based on all the kids that scored similar to them all the way around along the, the time. Um, the state wants us to be around 50% of growth. They feel like that's a really good target, and I think you'll see on a, on a future slide that we're really close to that in almost every grade level. So that's really good news. High school completion, luckily for Reading, we've never had a hard time with that. Um, our high school completion rates are high. We do really well with four year. We have a number of kids that sometimes need an extra year, and, and it's not a high number, very low number, but we, we're really good with that. Um, progress towards English proficiency, they're starting to look at that at certain levels because you have to have a certain number to have them report out. Um, we're making progress in that. I, we, I, our three uh, EL teachers do an amazing job. Our numbers are growing. I think we're at 47 this year, um, and they're all over schools, so they really are working hard, um, and they look at those access tests, those WIDA tests that they take, um, and they, they use that. Chronic absenteeism, um, those of you who have been uh, parents in Reading know that our principals have done an amazing job with this. Um, and not even just looking at overall percentage, because our percentage as a district is really high, but the kids that are absent a lot are absent a lot. So, so many kids in Reading are here 100% of the time, or 99 or 98. So our numbers are crazy high. As a district, we never have to worry about that, which is huge. But the kids that are absent sometimes more than 10 days, 
like that's a problem. 10 days is a lot. That's, you know, when you start thinking of 180 school days, 18 days is 10% of the school year. And if they're not here, we can't teach them. They are really doing lots of different things from uh, dance parties to really just phone calls home, really just super, super work that's based on best practice, never making kids feel badly about it because we know we have kids with medical and, and anxiety issues, but really doing a great job of noticing, which the research says really helps. Uh, this last one is a new category last year, and it was on advanced coursework. And I was really sad because we didn't get points in that. And we were sort of like, what? We have a lot of kids in advanced courses. And it's primarily APs and higher level math and science. Um, I'm happy to say that we got the full four points this year. I had suspected that it was um, statistical because our numbers were skewed. We had a bigger cohort a couple of years in a row. And then our numbers went down, so our percentages kind of went down. And I think, I, you know, I don't know that to be true, but it seems like likely. Um, this chart is really small, and I included it. This was in that memo that went out uh, the day that the scores were released. But it gives us an overall of, and for me, I look at that meeting and exceeding expectations at the district and state. That's kind of like the bullseye. Like, that's what we look at. Uh, we really look at as a district in certain grades. And again, this is we're looking at a grade level view. You will not hear me talk about this grade at this school, this grade at that school. That's going to be presented at the school level with principals. We realize that there are some inconsistencies around uh, some of the grades and some of the schools. The principals and I are all over it. So uh, I just want to assure the school committee that that is happening. And I, I hope, last year I made it to many of the um, MCAS presentations. I hope to make it to all of them this year, or as many as I can. Sometimes they're on the same night. I can tell you, I hope parents go to them, because I think that's the level of specificity of like, OK, third grade didn't do as well as we'd hoped, so this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're working on. Uh, those conversations are already taking place. Um, you notice in the far furthest right-hand corner, there's the student growth percentile, and that's that 50% that um, we're talking about. And you can see most of them are like you know, 50.6, 49.7, so really, really close to where we want to be. So what are the changes this year? This isn't a change. We're now in the third cycle of grades three to eight of next generation. So we're now starting to get more information on that. Um, they're starting to release a little bit more. We're starting to get a little bit more comfortable with the online platform. That's still always an issue, especially for elementary. Fifth and eighth grade, uh, science had next generation tests. And again, the state gave us absolutely nothing released before then, so we saw very little. Um, the good news is we did well in science overall. So that's really good news. Grade 10 ELA and math went to online and, and next generation. Um, and the, the test is very different. Uh, we don't have those long comps the way we did, the whole day of writing, um, all of that. There, there are essays, but they're shorter. Um, and they're a little bit more structured, um, especially at the high school. Next year, the high school science, which we do biology here, primarily most of our kids take the ninth grade biology test, um, will be next generation. So next year, we will be all next generation and no paper tests, no legacy tests. Um, one a little caveat about that is, and you probably read about this in the news, there is um, a high school retest coming up. We always do high school retests for kids that may have not reached the requirement. We have a small number of that at Reading, um, and they are eligible to take the retest. This year, because of one of the questions that was deemed inappropriate uh, because of cultural insensitivity, um, we are going to have a, a large number of uh, high school kids to <coughs> retest the test. So you may hear that in the community, like, how many kids flunked the test? They're all retaking it. They are allowed to do it so that they may qualify. If they get a certain uh, percentage, they can qualify for the Quincy Adams Scholarship. Um, so we, we actually sent out, Kate, uh, who had to leave but was here earlier, she sent out a survey to everyone who could retake it based on their scores. Um, and it was up to families if they wanted to. But we are going to have a large cohort retesting. Um, you know, that's how the state's doing it. So we want to give kids every opportunity, but it is kind of a logistical nightmare because um, it's three days of testing that we hadn't planned for, for, for a lot of um, juniors. Uh, so similar scores from last year. Overall, our scores in three to eight were almost identical to last year. Uh, when we look at that cohort. We had a slight improvement in math um, percentage-wise. We had really strong scores in fifth and eighth grade science. Um, 
that was really exciting to me because, again, it was a new test. It was a new legacy. We had very few released items. It was, it was very different than the last test. And if you look, our fifth grade, 71.8% um, meeting and exceeding. The state average was 48%. And grade eight was 66 meeting and exceeding, and the state average was 46. So well above the state average. Um, and certainly growth to be made in that, but really strong scores. RMHS highlights, uh, we can't compare. So last year I talked about how we couldn't compare the elementary grades to years before because Next Generation was still in full swing. Um, this year I'm telling you that about high school. So we're basically starting over. They set targets that I have no idea how they set them. They it really, the state has not been clear on how if we met targets to clean, tar to, um, decline, but met the target, improved but didn't quite make the target. I don't have a clear understanding in the past. It was very clear. Here was your CPI index. Here's where you're headed. It was a very clear line of where that target was. This year um, at the high school, the good news is we met most of our targets, um, but the reality is it, we'll know more next year. And they're still, they're still letting us know that they're not quite sure what the targets will be for next year. Um, ELA grade 10 was 10% greater than the state. Math was 17% greater in meeting exceeding than the state, um, and again, we felt pretty good about that because we didn't have a lot of um, pre-loading of this uh, new test. The RMHS Science, which is the only legacy test, showed 4% more than last year and was 11% higher than the state. So the high school scores were solid um, and our accountability looks like that. And like I said, the advanced coursework, we got the four full points, which I was excited about. I was shocked that we got zero the year before. Um, so if one of the things that we look at when we look at data, and I know this slide is hard to see, I apologize. I tried to get rid of those blue lines and I don't know, I couldn't. Um, we look at the state. So for instance, like grade three ELA overall, we went up to 7.8%. Grade eight, we went up to 1%, and um, in math, we went up 1%, and the state went down 1%. So again, we're way higher than the state average in all areas, but we do look at, that's kind of the first thing we look at, is like which grades didn't do well in the state. And if and it, we don't even look at the state scores necessarily, we look at the percentages up and down, because that really helps us. So here is grade three at uh, the snapshot, and again, like I said, this is the 5,000 foot view. This is every school in Reading, grade three. The blue is this year, the red is last year. This is just comparing ourselves to ourselves, because as you know, we don't uh, typically compare, uh, none of the school districts compare to other districts. We just really look at Reading versus Reading. And even though the different cohorts, we really look at that. And that exceeding and meeting those two far right corners are the ones that we wanna see so many kids in. Overall, third grade went up 7%, which is awesome. Um, grade three mathematics, again, looking at meeting and exceeding. Um, RPS is at 65%, um, which was 3% more than last year. Again, that's sort of the, the benchmark of that meeting and exceeding. Grade four went down a little bit. Um, so we looked at that and we said, hmm, 3% down from last year, still really strong scores, 62% at meeting and exceeding. But look at here, the state went down 7% there. So that test obviously, maybe there was a question that threw a lot of kids. 
one of the difficulties with MCAS, and I know you know this, they don't release all the questions. They let us know what standards are covered, but they don't. They, they keep a lot of the questions hidden, and frankly, less and less are being released um, because they don't. They want to reuse them. They used to. I was on an MCAS development team years ago, and they used to relate, release about 70 or 80 percent of the test um, test questions because they built new tests every year. That's a very expensive model. They are now releasing. What do they say? Like less than half, 30 to 40 percent. Fourth grade math, um, looking at the state, the state did go up modestly, 1%. Again, um, if you look, our exceeding are the same and our meeting expectations are virtually the same. But again, we're still going for that improvement in meeting and exceeding. Uh, we love to see our scores in the high 70s um, in that, if possible. Grade five ELA, this was an area that we definitely look, are looking at. Um, the state went down 19% in this area. So something about the fifth grade ELA test, we're certainly pulling it apart and looking at all the release questions, looking at all the standards, but definitely saying what could we have done better uh, as a district? What is our curriculum telling us? What are our, our pacings looking at? All of that. Uh, grade five math, same thing, uh, 6%. This one, um, definitely raised some flags for us because overall the state went up 3% from last year. So one of the things I will tell you is we were at, we're at 65%. So when, we, when I say I would love to see us, you know, 65, 70, even closer to 80, that's closer to where we want to be. So 65% is still really good for, for that, but it's still lower than what we want. Grade 6 ELA, we had really strong scores here. Um, and especially in exceeding, I, I love when we see a big jump like that. Um, plus seven are uh, meeting expectations, and 76% of our kids got meeting or exceeding in sixth grade, which is huge. Um, and I do think, you know, kudos to the school committee and to the town and really the uh, whole middle school team who really lobbied to keep that double session of sixth grade because I, I definitely think that that's part of it, that our kids have that practice time that's so important. Um, with writing and revising their writing and really looking critically at literacy. Um, sixth grade math also did really well, a 4% change. And again, look at that meeting, that exceeding. We went from 8% to 15%, and I always love that. Um, certainly, we look at things like how many that not meeting expectations. You know, we don't want to see that rise either. And for most cases, we didn't have a lot of rise in that. If you look at each chart, you see very, very little changes in those, which is also a really good um, data point for us. Grade seven ELA, this one definitely showed a, a modest dip at 4%. Um, the state did go up a couple of points there. Again, at 66%, you know, it, this isn't like a, a raise the battle cry, but um, we definitely are looking at things and we're definitely looking at um, a school that, you know, we only have two schools and did one school outscore different things at different grade levels? And that's something that last year I said a one year dip isn't a trend. A two year dip is something to look at and a three year is a trend. I think I used that quote if anyone remembers me saying that. Year two, we're looking at that. We're definitely digging in deep and saying, all right, what are we doing? What, what's working at one school? And that's across the board when we have schools that really scored higher than other cohorts, but we're doing that internally. Um, at the at the building level and really at the teacher level the grade level teams are really unpacking that together um, Grade seven mathematics again a modest dip um, And this one too, the state w went up two percent, but just as a comparison the state's meeting and exceeding is 48 percent and Reading's is 63 so, you know, we're cer certainly well above the state average um, But definitely we always want to see improvement Grade eight ELA, again, um, um, a modest dip at 5% um, lower, and let's see, the state stayed exactly the same. So uh, 49 to 68% this year, 68% um, meeting and exceeding. Uh, still a pretty, pretty good score there, but definitely, you know, we're gonna ask some questions. Like how come <coughs> we, we have more kids not meeting expectations? Look from four to six. This is one that we definitely will look at. Grade eight mathematics, uh, same same question on this. The state did go down in this area as well. The state is only at 40% meeting and exceeding, and we're at 66, uh, but you saw most of our other scores were in the high 60s or 70s, so this is definitely something that we're gonna be looking at at the district level. 
So student growth, as I said to you, 50 is kind of that magic number. You could see um, that in ELA, we are right around 50 and in some cases uh, higher. So sixth grade, you see student growth is all the way up to 60.6, .6, which is enormous. That's probably as high as you would get in student growth. Um, it's really high to, hard to get higher than, and, and even seventh grade, you saw our scores dipped a little bit, but look at the growth, 55.4 and 54.4. So we look at that as well. Our achievement scores only tell part of the picture. When we have a high student growth number, that's good news for us, that overall our scores may not have improved at, you know, in achievement, but overall the kids that needed to grow did grow. So that tells us part of the picture, and the state equally weights achievement and growth, just so you know. Um, and we met almost all of our targets in growth this year. So um, that's exciting. Um, but you can see our targets, I mean, 50 is where we're, the state wants us to be. We're almost at that at every single level. And the ones that we're not at 50, we're in striking range. I have to tell you that that's probably as good a student growth chart as any district would have. Um, because it is really hard to get to that sweet spot at 50. Grades five and eight science, um, I only compared Reading to the state because we, you know, being uh, the new leg, the, getting rid of the um, legacy test and going with only the next generation, we only have one year. Um, you can see our scores outrank the state. Um, the, the science test is hard. It really is everything pre-K to, to five in science. Um, and our fifth grade teachers do a, a great job of really reviewing a lot of complex topics. I do think a lot of the work that's been done uh, at the curriculum level with uh, No Adam and the materials and even the K to two materials, we're gonna see these scores even improve. I, I, I really think that we're getting more and more science into the hands of teachers um, and they're really embracing it. So um, it's definitely exciting to see that. I'm, very excited to see where those scores head. Uh, eighth grade as well, the science scores were extremely strong, um, much, much higher. And if you look at uh, the, the last category, because they don't call it warning or failing anymore, it's not meeting expectations. The state had 13% and we only had 3%. So when you think of our small <coughs> sizes, 3% is, is, is kids that probably we could totally identify that really might have struggled with the science test. but. We don't want anyone not to, to get to that uh, partially meeting or meeting expectations for sure. So grade uh, 10, ELA, again, I could only compare this to the state because it's brand new. Um, I, I feel like we're still unpacking what the, um, nec what the next generation tests look like. Um, we're not allowed to read overhead the shoulders of kids. It's actually against the rules. So we can only really look at the released questions. Um, we're not allowed to look at kids while they're taking it. It's, it's part of the protocols. So um, the kids reported less writing, less fatigue in writing, and obviously they're typing, um, but they reported that the questions were a lot harder. Uh, a lot more uh, point of view questions, a lot of putting yourself into situations and making hypotheses and mm -hmm. guessing things like that. Obviously grammar, um, capitals, you know, all of the stuff that goes into English. But we definitely heard that the English test felt like a beast this year. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but our scores were extremely good and certainly much better than the states. Uh, grade 10 math, we did a really strong job on that as well. Uh, we did not get a report that those were more challenging. Um, I think that they felt similar to the last test. And again, you see we have very few kids not meeting expectations. So those are the kids that have to retest. Um, so again, I just want to put that out again, because when you hear in the district that there are many kids retesting, that 3% is a very small amount of kids um, that are you know, allowed, and, and we want them to retest so that they can um, pass the MCAS. Um, so that's where we are with grade 10. And then grade nine science, which is the last remaining legacy test, um, extremely high scores. Um, I think we, we do really well in the, in the ninth grade science. The biology department here, the science department does a great job of preparing them for this. Uh, overall, our statistics in ninth grade science have been very, very high. And look at our warning score. We only have 1%. So that's, that's pretty low. Um, student growth, and this is something that we are, and I mentioned that with ELA, that it was definitely a challenging test. Uh, our math scores, uh, student growth 49.9, right in that sweet spot of where we want to be. English 46.8. So that's definitely something we're going to, now that we've had a year under our belt, to kind of look at that and say, all right, 
what challenged our kids because we you know we've always scored really really well and the scores were still very good um, definitely high in the state but you know we want to see those growth higher um, so what are we doing now um, our data coach has already met with every school principal <clears throat> at least once if not several times to collaborate about information gleaned from data sets so what it, what does that mean well they're reviewing both grade level and cohort trends so looking at cohorts across so like if you have an eighth grade team what did they do in seventh grade what did they do in sixth grade did the scores surprise us what kind of surprises did we have but also looking at what did eighth grade do last year versus what did eighth grade do this year or what did eighth grade at this school do compared to eighth grade at that school so really all of that <clears throat> is part of these conversations the principals and the teams are starting to dig into the data um, I know the middle schools are going to have some time on the November 5th um, PD day the uh, fall Institute day to really do that universally um, and really dig into that data and explore information including question type what they do release is we know what type of question it is is it a multiple choice it is a short answer um, we know we also know what standard it's attached to so we can go back and say all right where does this standard live in our curriculum we, you know if we have you know 10 questions that all of our kids struggle with that are from a certain standard we can look and say all right well where where does that live in our curriculum and if it doesn't maybe it should um, kind of a funny little anecdotal story a few number of years ago the just statewide there were a lot of geometry questions in a certain grade I think it was fourth grade so everyone went back to those geom do you remember that Lisa Marie with the geometry questions <laughs> it was crazy so there were like all these geometry questions and geometry often taught them later in the year in fourth grade so everyone went back and put geometry like anywhere they could put it in and rearranged their pacing guides and whatever the next year there was one geometry question so they you know we're hesitant to like completely recook the recipe and and really just looking strategically one of the things that's really helping us is our memorialization of curriculum work um, the team that you know I dismissed to go home um, they um, and the team that's still here which I love um, they are spending so much time really looking at that and and, and having thoughtful conversations <coughs> about what are the standards what are our units and what kind of pacing should we be doing? We cannot spend eight weeks on a certain unit because we know we have another unit coming right up. And really memorializing that and sharing that information. That's part of that goal of that curriculum guide work that we've been doing. Um, and that's done at the elementary level in every subject but social studies. Uh, we'll be working on that. And we're just starting to really memorialize it at the middle school. Um, and it's, it's a perfect time for that because with MCAS data, we now have information to say, okay, what are, what, what are we doing and where are we doing it and how do we take best practice and, and, and shift that across the board. Um, so along with that we look at annual trends, we look at results around standards and content. We also look at the needs of demographic groups. Um, the data tells us lots of things. When we have, you know, if we have a small cohort and there are 12 high needs kids, that's going to impact the scores at times it sometimes does and certainly that is not to imply that all high needs kids struggle with MCAS but we that's something that we have to look at and does that affect that data it might it might not um, school-based teams are using MCAS results in concert with our district and school-based data to inform practices and curriculum instruction support of individual students we're looking at attendance we're looking at our reading and math assessments that we're primarily doing at um, elementary school but we're starting to really do more of that at the middle school we're looking at report card data um, what's really exciting is um, Courtney our data coach is really doing um, a lot is trying to have we're using a platform now where eventually um, principals are going to be able to log in at grade level at student level at cohort level and see in a snapshot all of these things in one place instead of pulling out a spreadsheet for attendance a spreadsheet for Fountas and Pinnell a spreadsheet for AMC math a spreadsheet for MCAS it's all going to be on this analytics platform that we're using and we're building that right now um, and it's very exciting the principals are really enjoying that and obviously we're going to continue to do district work in ELA math and science things like the curriculum guides that haven't been developed or tweaking the ones that have been pacing guides uh, which are part of the internal documents that we're using and other tools like common assessments things like that best practice templates for kids that might need more scaffolding 
all of that. Um, Courtney and I are setting up, um, well, I'm skipping the, the, the first one. Uh, curriculum directors, uh, Heather and Allison have already had, I think, three or four marathon sessions with our data coach to really look at the STEM scores and the humanity scores at each grade level, each school, and really unpack that together and look. Um, Courtney's a wizard with data, but she's not an educator, and they're really looking at the data from her lens and then looking at it from their lens so that we can all meet with the principals and give our best guess of some of the action items. Frankly, they are, they're the experts. They're in their buildings. They know their buildings better than anyone. Courtney and I are, are starting our roadshow next week. Uh, and we'll be meeting with every single principal to go over their action plans um, and really memorialize what those look like. So, you know, it, it, and, and that's every school. Some of the schools, you know, have great scores and that's to be rejoiced and we've had a lot of real successes. Um, and then there's their grades and, and subjects and, that we need to really look at. But we're memorializing that, we're having action plans and we're gonna regularly meet. So. That's where we're at. I think overall the news is very good. Our accountability level as a district is up. Our scores are up in overall. And the things that aren't up, we know about and we have a plan to move forward. Thank Anything you. else? I'm sure there are questions. Somebody else go first. Go um, so I have two quick comments and then I do have a question. Um, one is, to me, the most important part of that entire presentation is the work that's being done to use the data mm -hmm. to address wherever there are inconsistencies. So, and I understand that has to be done at the building level because it could be a cohort. It, it could be any one of a number of factors or many factors that, have, that the boots on the ground need to know what that is. So it's good to know that this data is being used in a productive way. Um, so I was happy to hear that. I also want to applaud the focus on growth as well as achievement because if you just focus on achievement, the, the focus tends to be on just getting kids to meet the standards, but you might have a kid is, or a group of kids who are meeting the standards or even exceeding the standards but exhibiting low growth. On the one hand, it's great that they're at grade level. That low growth score indicates that they are not reaching their potential. So I, I'm thrilled that the state is and that you are focusing on growth as well because it captures a group of kids that, that we need to be looking at as well as kids who aren't meeting the great standards who certainly need attention to. So those are my two comments. My question is the science scores are eye-popping. Um, what do you attribute that to? <laughs> Outstanding science instruction. Um, no, I honestly think that the district has really spent a lot of resources, time, energy, PD, and money on, I mean, we have STEM scopes at the middle school, we have No Adam, um, Heather has worked really diligently with the elementary team at K-2 at getting really like hands-on materials and, and really talking about the science behind science. Mm -hmm. that, is that redundant? I don't know. Too bad she's not here. But um, even with the report card revisions we did, she, every grade level has, um, an indicator in the new report cards in every area of science. So there's a physical science question, Earth science, thank you, Joanne's, thank God Joanne's here. Earth science and life science. So each grade level, even to that specificity, we're really focusing, especially with our elementary team, that it's not just about life science, right? Uh, the kids love the life sciences, and you know, sometimes they like the other things too, but really that our standards have three branches of science and making sure that we, we don't miss any of them um, and really kind of helping to plot that out of like how do you fit it all in? As you know, the day goes by quickly and we do want to have time for play and we do want to have time for practice. So how do we fit in robust science units, social studies units? I mean, the middle school and the high school have the luxury of having a set schedule with the blocks and, and not that that's perfect either because it's hard to fit 48 you know, minutes, everything into 48 minutes. But I will tell you as a former elementary person and middle school person, but elementary, I really struggled with that of how do you get 10 pounds of potatoes in a five pound bag and still really understand the developmental level of kids. But it really does take a village and it starts at pre-K and K. So when you're doing sort of intro to earth science and life science and physical science, it's late, I'm sorry, physical science. <laughs> By the time you get, get <laughs> physical science, I need to get better at that so we can get better at that. It's yeah, 10, 20, 20, um, by so. fifth grade, it's not new to them. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's very exciting, but it also goes to show you that there was a comprehensive plan there 
um, and in the last couple of years, which the principal started before we even had a curriculum coordinator in place there, and now Heather has really just kind of jumped into that water, but it, I think it's really helped in the eighth grade. Um, the, the, the middle school science sciences have always been strong, but I think a lot of the inf infusion of, of supplies and materials, and really that STEM scopes is, is very exciting. The kids love it. Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge success and whatever we are doing in science is most definitely working. It's really something special. Tom? Okay, she took one of my big points. I was so excited about the, the science <laughs> scores. Um, they really do pop off the page. Um, in many ways. Um, and you hit on one of the other points I was going to look at, but I wanted to make sure and even maybe request that we get follow-ups on it because I see it as rather severe. Um, I'm trying to figure out how the right way to wor word this is, but the middle schools mm -hmm. have um, a very divergent path mm -hmm. in both ELA and math. Yep. Um, and it's really for the last seven years. It's not two years. It's not three years. It's well, Dad, can I just can I just uh, respectfully sure. correct you on that? The, the legacy test can't be compared to the scores mm -hmm. of the next generation. If you're talking about overall um, trends, you can say that if the discrepancies. But we're, from our purposes, we're only looking at legacy next generation to next generation and, and, and I'm talking about trends no okay I'm talking about comparatively when a cohort starts in sixth grade in the two different schools and they're more or less equal across time mm -hmm. across that seven eight years and when they end in eighth grade and there's a gap of scores of 17 24 18 13 10 points between those two those two schools over the last seven years I think that's something that's endemic that we really need to understand more of um, and it's really something that, in my mind, is almost more severe than what we went through with Joshua Eaton. It's not showing up as a level three, but it's showing up as a very vast difference in execution in one way, shape, or form. Um, so I understand that the middle school principals and the teachers are going through that, and I applaud that, and I very much appreciate that. In no way, shape, or form am I trying to proverbially throw anybody under the bus. But in looking at it, it's, it's severe and it's something I think we need to understand a little bit more. There was one thing that was said earlier today that I kind of went, huh, well, maybe that's related. And I'm sure you guys are looking at all the correlations and combinations and that's the, you know, the looping concept in seventh and eighth grade at Coolidge that I know does not happen at Parker, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's contributing, maybe something else is happening. Um, but it's rather severe amongst those two schools and I would, I don't know if the rest of the committee is interested, but I would be very interested in having follow-up conversations about how we're making changes in those those spaces. So we're happy to do that. I think um, I think we're looking at this, I don't disagree with you that anytime we have a rapid um, discrepancy like that, especially when we have two schools that, it, like you said, uh, they're both outstanding. We have ex excellent teachers at both schools, excellent leaders at both schools. So I think, um, we're gonna to continue to do some deep dives and really do that root cause analysis of like, if this, then what? And I think, you know, we're already having those conversations. Uh, you know, certainly we could have further conversations about that. Um, like I said, the action plans are gonna be critical of like, how can, it, and, it, and it is tricky. You know, this data work, these are a total of five days of testing in a 180 day period. And yet it's the only thing that we publicly have. Um, many of our internal testing uh, is not showing the same kind of marked changes. So we need to look at that. Like maybe it's just the science of testing. We have to look at that. But I, I will, I will um, I'm not ready to have the critical lens of like DEF CON 5 here, but I am definitely cognizant that we have to look at this very seriously. And I think we are. I appreciate that. I mean, I, and I'm, again, I don't want to in yep. any way, shape, or throat. Nope. You know, my principal sitting out there, I love her. So, you know, I don't, I don't, one of mine is sitting out there, right? So I don't want to say it in that way. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, in, in regards to that, and <laughs> looking at those growth numbers, you know, the numbers are showing at 53 or whatever for yep. middle school, but it's 61 and 40, right? I yep. mean, it's vastly different. Yep. Um, and that's consistently vastly different. For the last no, I, I think, I mean, years. you're wise to point that out, Mr. Wise. Um, but, you know, I think the reality is we're well aware of that. My role, I, you know, I'm very careful. I, I am not here to compare schools or compare grades. I'm here to give an overall view to all of you and to anyone who's watching at home. Um, 
of where we are, kind of like the State of the Union address, right? Mm -hmm. This is the state of the schools according to MCAS, which is one measure. Overall, the State of the, the Union is good. The reality is we do have some things that we're concerned about and we will definitely be working and we'll definitely be working on sharing that information. I, but I think it really comes at the building level. So that's when it's critical for even any of you to go to the MCAS presentations. I will be there. I will be helping the principals with, with their presentations. And I think we have that conversation together because what I don't want is a blame game, right? We have really good educators in this district working really hard. Kids are kids they're complicated it's not as easy as you know saying okay score better like it doesn't work that way we have to look at our best practice and make sure that we're giving them all the tools to be as successful as they can and i think nobody in reading is afraid of doing that work that's what we love about this town um so i i, I look at this as an opportunity I'm, I'm on board with that and i love the root cause analysis i love to get to that yep. you know um, and again, not with blame, not with finger pointing, nope. not with anything else, but just how do we improve the kids' growth and we their ability to We can do better, and learn, we know right? that, and we will. Um, and I just wanted to point out a couple other things, you know, just as I'm a numbers guy, like your data coach is. Yep. Um, you know, some of the, our scores versus the state. Yep. We have, in the last two years, some of the best improvement versus the state across, yep. you know, elementary and middle school. Um, in, in terms of a, a, a vast improvement and that that really versus Bay say the three years before that you know where it was kind of dropping down into the nines and ten numbers now it's up into the 22s 23s 24s differentiation from the state some of that's because we prepared for the tests and you all in this group voted for the curriculum materials and you guys implemented that and you know all that kind of fun stuff but I just want to point out that that positive is there too and, and I, you, you hit on it but it, it's almost even better to look at it in the lens of history, in my mind. Um, and I'm just one person. But when you look at it, is okay. It was eight. It was nine. It was ten. It's now the 20s, yeah. 22. Right? That's a big difference. Um, that said, I'm not and satisfied. I, I, I want more. I want. I want better. Excellence is great, and we're continuing to progress in that fashion. I will I tell you it. that I, I really think a huge um, impetus goes to the building level principals for that work, um, because I've only you know. I, uh, and, and Dr. Darty and his team, they gave them the tools and the resources to really do the collaboration. They've spent a lot of time collaborating as, as a team um, at the elementary level and at the middle school level. And I think it, that's the kind of work, like what are you doing and what's best practice at your school? And I mean, the curriculum guides and the curriculum materials and the resources, that helps us achieve our goal. But the really rich work happens when we do um, in-house PD and we really work with our teams. And, and they were strategic about it even before I got here. And, and we've even just built on that. So I, I, I think our success is only going to grow from here. And the more we have common things in places where people know how to find them, um, we, we can share that best practice. But thank you for, for pointing that out, because I agree, it's very dramatic. Linda. Um, thank you for this unpackaging and all the work that it takes to get here. Um, I'm struck, you, I was trying to figure out how to say what I wanted to say, and you gave me the words, 10 pounds of potatoes in a five <laughs> pound bag. It's a Chris Kellyism, sorry. <laughs> well, I'll quote, I'll just put quotes around it. I watch what you do, all of our administrators, our teachers do every day. Um, the presentation that we had earlier from our instructional specialists, the, um, the curriculum, just so much work that you do. And then I look at these scores that are from, how many days did you say? Eight? Five, you, five, five days. days of testing, and not including science, yeah. Of testing, and yet at the same time, our teachers are doing working out assessments through which our kids are learning through those assessments. They're assessments with a purpose, and they give our teachers and our administrators data to work on also, to unpackage that richness that you were talking about. And the question I keep thinking about is, these tests give us accountability scores mm -hmm. that get raised to the priority that leaves all the other work in the dust. And there's something that the public can grab onto and say, well, that number's better than that number. And, 
but I think we have to keep in perspective what those numbers mean. And I heard you saying that. And I thank goodness for Courtney, who can help with the analysis of, because I can't even imagine how you all would do that too. Like, there's just too much to do. Well, and in fairness, they do a lot of data work themselves, too. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to take away yeah. from that. But it, I guess what, where I'm going is that these tests take so much time yeah. away from, and there's 10 pounds in a five pound bag, and we're required to do it. Um, but I just, I want to keep the focus on the other things that you do and the other assessments yep. that you do and the ways that you're learning and, and tailoring the curriculum and the learning. That there, it's not all so about- So Linda, we're not a test-driven district by any means. MCAS, we, we, re we realize it's real, right? And we're gonna unpack this information and the, the, the grades and the cohorts that aren't doing as well, we're gonna definitely look at that. We are never gonna be, it, nobody in this district, and John set this priority well before I arrived on the scene, we are not a robotic test-driven district. Um, we realize that we want to do well and we want to showcase, but the richness of Reading and our vision of the graduate is so much more than this test. Um, and one of the analogies, and I'll give very quick deal on this, but last year when M um, Medco did their, all their research that Harvard did for them, and it was published in the Globe, one of the things that they showed is that Medco students don't actually outscore kids that are like them in Boston districts or in charter schools. In fact, they underscore charter schools. The charter schools in Boston are very MCAS driven. It's test, test, drill, 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 test. What the richness of Medco does is after that. Medco kids go on to college. They go on to graduate from college. They, they did this huge longitude, if you, if you Google it, the Boston Globe had a wonderful article on it. But it really showed that the Medco districts that receive the uh, Boston resident kids that go, those kiddos do well after high school. And not that they didn't do well in high school, but they didn't outscore their peers that from like families, these are families in Boston that said, public Boston <coughs> schools don't work for us. So we're gonna look for other options. And charters for them were, were the option. Those kids did better on the MCAS and worse in college. And to me, that vision of the graduate is that success. And it doesn't have to be college. It could be, you know, what did they call them? Any of the C's, you know, um, no, E's. Education, what was that, that uh, the employment, enlisting? <laughs> I think that's it, right? <laughs> so, you know, that's what we want for our kiddos. And I think we are a district that embraces, our kids are so successful in so many ways. MCAS is just one of them. And I think you made that point too, where it doesn't matter if you really teach to the test because the next year the test will focus on something different. And Some schools try, I will tell you, they do. Well, I thank Any you. Other questions? Yeah. Mr. Park? Question or a comment? Question. All right. Can you please share with us the dates and times of all the different schools so that yes. we can attend if we can? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Motion to adjourn. Wait, oh, no, it's a question. Oh. question. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't see I do. I actually have a note on it. Introduce yourself. Huh? <laughs> I saw Thank you. Hi, uh, Caitlin Taylor, uh, Lindsay Lane. Um, so I recognize this is not at a bring school it up, but level, it. but our school presentation is about a month out. So I just want to sort of respectfully request um, to acknowledge Wood End's fourth grade tests, 42% um, for math, so significantly you know, below much of Reading and below the state average. Um, so I just would love to see some resources being allocated, I have complete faith in our teachers and our principal, and I'm not worried about that, but clearly something is a little bit off with that group, or you know, maybe they had bad testing day, whatever it was. Um, you know, I know we gave a lot of resources to JE um, when they were going through their thing, so I'm hoping that we can do the same for Wood End. Um, and just also pointing out that looking at the scores, Wood End and Birch Meadow were on the lower end of Reading, um, and those kids are all gonna be going to middle school together, so I don't know that that means anything, but I trust you are smart people to figure that one out. <laughs> if anything needs to be looked at for that too, that's all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Caitlin. Any other questions?
no more on this. No, thank you. So just uh, before you do your adjournment, and then you Wait, can do I your adjournment. It on the table. <laughs> it was a motion. It should be. It should have been a notice. There, there was one. Ah, after the public comment, sorry. <clears throat> there was one art, one um, letter we received with regards to the softball field um, that I think we should make sure we support, if at all possible. Uh, Eric Bamer sent us a letter uh, mentioning this safety and security around the softball field. Um, that's the Birch Meadow softball field out there. Technically not on school property, but our softball players play on that field. Our girls and high school team play on that field. It's already um, being addressed, and, and uh, I know that we've talked yeah. to the town manager or figured something. Your, your point is well taken, and, and uh, I think Eric got, we sent something to Eric. We did I did respond to him, yes. Okay, thank you. Do you, do you need a second? <laughs> I'll second adjournment. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.